Church on your brother Zachwa, and with me is brother Kasafo. <laughs> <laughs> we hope everybody's enjoying your shower today this week, and uh, we have a great lesson in store for everybody. We're going to be going into the law of grace and truth. All right, and this is a very informative uh, lesson, and Allah and willing it changes a lot of our perspectives going forward in our walks, so that we can actually obtain unto the righteousness of Allah. All right, um, Brother Kasafo, without further ado, can we jump into John chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16, please? Sure. John 1 and 15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Right. So what we're going to be touching on today, we're going to be touching on grace so that we can actually understand what Allah grace is and how it actually works for us and in, in, in our favor um, for us actually to come out of our iniquities. All right. Can we get the definition of grace? Uh, G5485, please. Sure. G5485 is graciousness as gratifying of manner or act, abstract or concrete, literal, figurative or spiritual, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. All right. So as you've seen, it says of manner or act. So graciousness or being or showing grace actually comes out in our actions. And also it says figurative or spiritual. So gracious or being grace or graciousness actually shows forth in our spirituality as well. That means how we actually feel inside. This is why it says, especially the divine influence upon the heart, because we have to actually be gracious or, or have that grace within our hearts. And then it comes forth in our manner of action. So this is why it's a reflection in the life. The grace that we have in our heart is a reflection. It comes it comes out in our behaviors, in our actions, in our life. So if we actually appreciate the grace that is given to us, it'll come forth in our actions and it'll be in our hearts. Can we uh, get the Thayer's definition, if you don't mind, Brother Kassel? Sure. His definition, goodwill, loving kindness, favor, of the merciful kindness by which Allah Hayyam, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtues. So you see what that grace actually does when it actually enters into your heart. It's the merciful kindness of Allah and it exerts his holy influence upon souls. So that means that it goes out and it impacts their life. Then after it enters into their heart, it turns them to Christ. It keeps them and strengthens them and increases them in Christian faith. It increases you in your works and your good works and keeping the laws bringing forth fruits of the spirit. And it also increases you in knowledge and affection towards others because you understand the affection that was given toward you by even Christ himself that died for us. And there's no better love than when a man laid down his life for his friends. So you can see that it's actually Yache who's actually strengthening us in that brotherly affection towards one another. 
and it kindles them to exercise of Christian virtues. So then you start keeping the commandments. You start bringing forth fruits of the spirit, which is the virtues of good works of righteousness. So you can see how having that, that grace in itself, really appreciating the grace actually brings forth fruit. But if you take the grace for granted, it also brings forth bad fruit or another fruit. So we're going to see the parallel of both of these things, of actually taking Elohim's grace for granted and actually taking it to heart and seeing how those two play out in our actions. Now, the grace is to turn us to Christ and increase us in the good works of the virtues of the law without suffering death for the mistakes that are made in the learning process. So that's what the grace is actually doing. It's actually a grace period in, in another sense. Besides taking the grace and, and, and appreciating the grace, there is a more of an understanding of, of that grace period when it comes to Alahayim. Alahayim has a certain period where we are able to learn and that he's not going to penalize us for doing wrong in our learning because we're actually striving to learn and to, and to get it right and to understand. That's why the scripture says, a righteous man falleth several times, but he get us back up because it's a learning process. You're going to fall, you're going to make mistakes, but you want to get back up and learn from those mistakes so that you don't continue a habit of continuing in those mistakes, or you don't create a cycle of continuing in those mistakes. And that's what we don't want, because that actually makes us fall into sorrow. Whereas we're not falling into the repentance and the joy of Elohim, we're falling into the, into sorrow, which is an evil spirit that causes us not to go forward or not to get back up, as is quoted. So a righteous man falls several times, but he gets back up. That sorrow won't allow you to get back up. That sorrow would keep you falling. So this is why we have to understand we have a grace period for us to actually learn. Because as time progresses and as time goes forward, things are going to change where we're going to be back under the rod. So according to Ezekiel 20, there is going to be a time where we're going to be back under the rod and that grace period is going to be done. So it's it's our opportunity to seize it, to actually do what is needful for us to get to the place we need to get to before that grace period has elapsed. All right. Uh, Casa, can we jump into John chapter 1, verse 17 and continue? John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Yahweh Christ. Right. So the law of judgment is when we sin, we are put to death without mercy. And that was given by Moses. So we actually died by the hands of men. Um, can, you, can you read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, please? Hebrews 10 and 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Right. So according to the old law, you will have to have two or three witnesses see or attest for what the person did, and then they would die because of the testimonies of those witnesses. Right. But it's different with Christ. Um, Christ gave grace and truth for us not to be condemned for a transgression. So we can learn from the experience to sin no more. He wanted us to actually learn from our experiences so that we would not continue in them, but that we would learn from them. And that was the grace and truth that Yahweh was bringing forth to save us. But also there's a bad side to that because then you take the grace for granted. And that's where many people fall into is actually taking the grace of Allah for granted and continuing the sin because they're not being harmed. But if you believe in Yache, then things will be different because you're not going to take it for granted because you're going to know everything that Elohim did for you. 
and you're going to have that grace enter into your heart. And Allah and willing, that's what happens by the end of this lesson. Uh, can we jump over to John chapter 8, verse 7, Brother Casa, please? Sure. John 8 and 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. All right. So this is the backstory. This is the woman who they had caught in adultery and they were bringing her before Yache because they wanted Yache to exercise the law of Moses against her. All right. So Moses law gave credence to stone her, but grace and truth doesn't justify condemning her for matters are now in the hands of Allah. I am holy. So Allah I am deals with people. The vengeance is of Allah. And we don't take it upon ourselves to, to judge one another. Could we continue in uh, John 8 and 8 and 9, please, Brother Kasa? Sure. John chapter 8, verse 8. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Yache was left alone, and the woman standing in the mist. All right. So Yache said, he who was without sin cast the first stone. And everybody had to examine themselves. So you see, only Yache and the woman are standing there. The only one without sin is Yache, the just, and he didn't stone her himself for grace and truth's sake. Let's see what grace and truth is meant to lead us to do. So let's continue with the story. Go ahead, Brother Casa. When Yache had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Yache said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Right. So you notice the accountability. To keep the law of truth isn't done away by grace, as she is still accountable to do right. Now that she is given his grace, she has the more to do right. That's why he told her to go and sin no more. The grace is as it was meant to truly do. Lead us to go sin no more in appreciation for the kindness and not condemning us or some animal by the hands of men when we commit a trespass. Seeing we have been forgiven for so much, this is the light of Christ. So Christ's light is to see, see our own sins and our own trespasses and how much Allah has forgiven us for us to then take accountability and say, okay, that's not right. I have to make changes. I can't just continue doing what I want to do and feeling like because other people have sins that my sins are forgiven and, and they're not accounted for. And that would be the wrong mindset of the woman to go forward with after that. After she had been caught in adultery because she committed the act, she did wrong. But if Yache told her to go and sin no more, and she went forth, not taking to heart that Yache told her to go and sin no more and actually was holding her accountable, then she would be taking Alheim's grace for granted. So that's not what we want to do. We don't want to take Alheim's grace for granted. And after Alheim has forgiven us for something or is expecting something of us, after we know we have done something that was wrong, to go forward and continue in iniquity. Now let's see what Yache continues to talk about. Go ahead. Can we read on John 8 and 12, please, Custom? John 8 and 12. Then spake Yache again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So following him will lead to coming out of darkness. So following him will lead to come out of sin, to walk in the law of life, 
for the sake of grace given to learn to do it without being condemned in the learning process. Christ sacrificed himself so that we may have grace to change and walk in the light of the law. That sacrifice was made, yet after it was made, the accountability to keep the law hasn't gone away by evidence of Paul's teachings. As his gospel is who we shall be judged by. Today you will see this as we go through scripture. The Lord has mercy in this life to give us a chance to do right on our own, but we will be held accountable in the end for how we use his grace. Casa, can we jump over to the Apocalypse of Paul? Um, this is what, chapter 3? Yes, yeah, sir. All right, thank you. Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 3. For indeed the Son, the great light, often addressed the Lord, saying, Lord Allah Almighty, I look upon the impieties and the injustices of men. Permit me, and I shall do unto them what are my powers, that they may know that thou art Allah, I am alone. And there came a voice, saying to him, I know all these things, for mine eye sees and ear hears, but my patience bears them until they shall be converted and repent. But if they do not return to me, I will judge them all. So we get to see the mindset of Alahayim. The mindset of Alahayim is he knows everything that we do. His eyes see and his ears hear everything that we do and say. But his patience bears them, hoping that we're going to convert and repent. But if they don't repent, he's going to judge us. So I, we want to we want to learn some things so that we can not be confused to think that Alahayim operates in another fashion, or in a fashion that benefits our iniquity, where we don't have to change. Can we continue in the Apocalypse of Paul chapter five, please, Kasa? Apocalypse of Paul chapter five. Frequently also, the earth too exclaimed to the Lord against the sons of men, saying, Lord Allah Almighty, I above every other creature of thine and harmed, supporting the fornications, adulteries, homicides, thefts, perjuries, and magic, and ill doings of men, and all the evil they do, so that the Father rises up against the Son, and the Son upon the Father, the alien against the alien so that each one defiles his neighbor's wife. The father ascends upon the bed of his own son, and the son likewise ascends the couch of his own father. And in all these evils, they who offer the sacrifice to thy name have defiled thy holy place. Therefore, I am injured above every creature, desiring not to show my power to myself and my fruits to the sons of men. Permit me, and I will destroy the virtue of my fruits. And there came a voice and said, I know all the things, and there is none who can hide himself from his sin. Moreover, I know their impieties, but my holiness suffers them until they be converted and repent. But if they do not return unto me, I will judge them. All right. So we get to see the earth is taking account of everything that we do as well. And everything happens on the earth. Just to show you that Allah sees and knows and hears everything. It's an easy thing for Allah to send a proclamation for the earth to not bring forth her fruit. But what would that do? All men would perish for famine. But look how Allah operates. He says, I know all things, and there is none who can hide himself from his sin. Moreover, I know their impieties. I know what they're doing. I know their iniquity. But my holiness suffers them until they be converted and repent. Look at that great hope for us. And to be honest, Allah hath more hope than a lot of us have for ourselves.
So this is why Elohim, this is why we're talking about grace today. Because Elohim is showing us so much grace, but yet we're not taking heed to it being consumed in our lust or whatever desires that we have that's contrary to Elohim. But we're not thinking about how it may be affecting someone else. Specifically, Elohim. It's his patience and holiness that's preserving us alive, though we sin. He has given us grace our whole life not to judge us with death for our sins and hopes we will utilize his grace period to change and overcome sin by repenting and turning unto him in good works. We actually have to make the decision. And as we continue reading, we're going to see how he is waiting for us to make a decision. And even in some cases, how he will put us in circumstances <laughs> to make decisions. Uh, can we continue in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, please, Casa? Sure. Romans 6 and 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. All right. So we aren't under the law of judgment, where when we sin, us or some animal has to die, but rather having the grace to get it right while we're alive. All right. And as we spoke about in, in Ezekiel chapter 20, there is actually a time when the grace is going to be over and we're going to be back under the rod. So that means that the grace period will be done and we will have to keep the commandments or we will die. Um, continue to Romans 6 and 15, please, Catherine. Well, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Allah forbid. All right. So Allah forbid us to abuse the grace of not being judged with death at this time to continue in our sins. He didn't give us liberty to continue in our lust after we sinned. So after we commit a trespass, he doesn't give us grace to continue sinning or continue going on a downward spiral of doing wrong because we can't get it right or we feel we can't get it right because we messed up being hard on ourselves and falling into sorrow and giving into wickedness, projecting and and forecasting grievous things upon ourselves that we can never get it right and we're never going to obtain. That's what they want. That's what the evil spirits want. They want you to fall into doubt. They want you to fall into sorrow. They want you to fall into wickedness. They want you to get angry about it. Because what does that do? It, that keeps you right where you are. And then what happens? It stirs up hatred. Now you're looking at everyone else instead of looking at yourself and comparing yourself amongst everyone else to make yourself feel better. That's the process of evil spirits. It happens to everybody if you give in to it because that's where they go. That's how they operate. That's where they're trying to take you. Eventually, they're all trying to lead you to the same place. No matter how they operate and no matter how they differ when they combine with one another, they all have the same end goal. So let's 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 use this grace and this liberty that we're called unto to do right and, and seize the opportunity. Katha, can we um go jump over to Galatians chapter five or thirteen, please? Sure. Galatians five and thirteen. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Right. So the grace and liberty from judgment from men not to be put to death was given so we could have an occasion to work on love to serve one another by keeping the law to love ourselves and our neighbors as ourselves, which is the second greatest commandment. So you see that that liberty that we were given 
was so that we can learn to love. And by loving one another, we will serve one another. Because love is selfless. Hatred is selfish. So if I'm constantly looking for my own gain, I automatically know that hatred is in me. But if I'm looking to see what I can do for somebody else so that they have what they need or I can make sure that someone else is okay, then I know that love is in me. So if I have a, a good inclination to do something well for somebody and then another inclination enters into my inclination that is something selfish for myself, I, I automatically know what's trying to enter in because the good inclination is going to be something to do for someone else to help them. The bad inclination is going to be for myself. And it gets very, very clear once you have the knowledge and understanding of how they operate. Now, as for us, we, many of us, we have to learn these things. We have to gain the knowledge. We have to gain the wisdom, the understanding. And with that, you have to work on humility because I, for one, myself, when I was younger, I struggled with pride and I couldn't hear anyone else. I didn't want to hear anyone else because I already felt I knew the answer. And because of that, it caused me, one, not to grow I was the same person year after year because I wasn't growing. There was opportunities where I could learn something that would have been very, very beneficial for me. But because I was coming off like I already knew the answer or I already was lying and deceiving and saying I already knew the answer, I didn't learn the answer or I didn't learn how to do something. So you see that by me refusing instruction, I was operating in hatred towards myself because pride is hateful towards men and Elohim. Let's, uh, let's jump over to Proverbs 15 and 32 so you can see the grounds of what I'm talking about and then we can further explain it. Brother Costa, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Proverbs 15 and 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul. All right. So by me refusing instruction or not wanting to do something because it wasn't what I wanted to do, I was despising my own soul. And learning those habits, it didn't help me serve Elohim. Because Elohim is all about giving you instruction, giving you wisdom for you to walk in it, giving you commandments to keep you away from evil. Like, he's all about protecting us. But in my pride, in my hatred, I didn't feel the need to be protected. So you know what I did? I walked after my own counsel. Because I felt that I could protect myself. That I knew for myself, I was my own Elohim. I didn't need Elohim. I knew good and evil for myself. Just as the devil promised Eve at the very beginning that she would know good and evil. I didn't see that I had to come out of the snares of the devil because I didn't know any better. And for many of us, we don't know any better. And we refuse instruction, struggling with that pride and hatred 
that we don't actually learn better. And this is why humility is a is great gain. Because humility allows you to be able to hear others. And not only internalize things for yourself and walk in that internalization, but actually hear others and what they're saying to see and, and, to, and to investigate it to see if it's actually true. Because that's what Elohim asked us to do. Elohim asked us to investigate the deity. So he says, read or learn the things that I'm telling you to do. Go and try it out and see if it works. Because for me, in my own experience, I was doing things that didn't work and that didn't bring good results. But I would say it's somebody else's problem as to why it didn't it didn't come out well when that wasn't true because as soon as I started implementing the things that Alahayim told me to implement in that scenario the results changed so was it that it was someone else that was the problem or was it me You shall know them by their fruit. If I wasn't bringing forth good fruit, then it's me. Can we uh, read Sirach 19 and 4, please, Kasa? Sirach 19 and 4. He that sinneth shall offend against his own soul. Now look at that. Because of my sins, I was offending against my own soul. Because I wasn't bringing forth good fruit because of my sin. I wanted to continue in my sin. And that's why it was hard for me to come out to investigate the deity. It was hard to implement or to hear something else because I was so fixated on my sin. How can I hear something else? When all I want to do is fulfill my lust, or all I want to do is, is, is do the thing that pleases me. That makes anybody that comes against me and says anything about my lust or the thing that I have pleasure in, it makes them an enemy. And you would treat them as such. Because they're coming against something that you desire and something that you love. And you know what you do? The thing that you love stays in the love box. And the person that comes against what you love in the love box, that looks like hatred. But is it? Is it hatred for somebody to see something that you're doing that's not good for you? To speak up about it? To get you to see that it's not good for you? Perspective. It's hard when you're in it. And you don't want to see the affinity that you have for a sin or a pleasure or a desire. And that's what Elohim deals with when it comes to us.
or that we put our desire, our pleasure, and our sin above him. And that's the only way that we can continue in it. Other than that, we will have to humble ourselves to Allah and walk in his ways because we love him more than our sin or our iniquity. So knowing that refusing the instructions of love and the law, because the, the law is actually love, it keeps us from evil. So refusing the instructions of the love of the law is hatred of our own soul and an offense to it when we act upon that hatred to sin. We have to be mindful not to hurt our own selves in hatred by letting any reason keep us back from taking the occasion to walk in love in the law. It's interesting that the, the more I grow, the more I see that it's actually It's actually Allah Hayyam trying, showing me so much love to, to pull me out of something that I don't want to come out of. Because if Allah Hayyam didn't pull me out, I would stay in it. And that's the truth. And it's the truth for all of us. If it wasn't for Allah, we would stay in it. And that's where his grace and truth comes in. Because he's actually delivering us. That's what it says, Yache, let him save. Like, let him go forth and save. He's going forth and he's saving us. Like, I, we're going to get to it at, at some place in this lesson, but our own will, our own will is what, is what kills technically all of us. And Allah is waiting for us to turn from our own will to repent and come back unto him. And it's not by our own doing that we turn from our own will. It's Yache forming himself and working in us that actually turns us from our own will. Because if not, we would die in it. Here are some other examples. Let's jump over to Sirach 20 and 22, please, Brother Kasim. Sirach 20 and 22. There is that destroyeth his own soul through bashfulness, and by accepting of persons, overthroweth himself. Right. So there that destroyeth his own soul through bashfulness. So not one to say something for the sake of not wanting to offend somebody. And because you don't want to offend someone, because you don't want anyone to, to have that type of feeling toward you, that you come and correct them, but you want everyone to like you, which is accepting a person's overthrow of himself. So because I want to be liked, I'm not going to correct that person. But it's causing me to sin. Because I'm a respect of persons. And you know what's going to happen is, is eventually you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're not, you're going to be bashful and you're not going to want to speak up and you're going to end up sinning with the person in the deed that they're doing. So 
So we have to stand for the law and the fruits of the Spirit, not accepting anyone over Elohim to guard our souls from sin. So hopefully this helps understand the simplicity of what we're doing to ourselves by sinning and not taking the occasions to walk in love. So this this is what we're, we're trying to get to right now as we're continuing to build is to understand how we're sinning against ourselves by not actually choosing love and having that love and that and understanding the grace and having it in the hearts of what Elohim is doing for us and why Elohim is doing it for us to actually bring us out of sin so that we can have the opportunity to make it unto the kingdom of Elohim. Now, Elohim gives us this grace so that we may attain righteousness. Now that we're, we're not being killed by being stoned or hung on a tree or burnt with fire like the law requires for certain sins, the Lord judges us himself and holds us accountable not to frustrate the grace given by continuing in sin. Can we jump over to Galatians chapter 2, verse 17, please, Brother Casa? Galatians 2 and 17. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Allah forbid. If we could be justified by Christ while staying in our sins, that would make Christ the minister of sin and go against the reason we were given grace. So it's not possible to be justified in the end by Christ if we are still found in our sins. I hope that everybody caught that. It's, it's not possible to be justified in the end by Christ if we are still found in our sins. It's impossible. Christ is not the minister of sin. He's telling us to come out of our sin, and he's given us the grace, the grace period to come out of it. Can we jump over to Galatians 2 and 21, please, Brother Casa? Sure. I do not frustrate the grace of Allah. Right. And neither do we want to. We don't want to frustrate the grace of Allah by taking advantage of it or taking it for granted. The grace was to learn to do righteousness and stop sinning. So it frustrates the grace process and the grace of Allah and purpose of it to continue in our sins without resistance because we weren't given grace as a reason to justify sinning. So we have to get to the place where we're withstanding sin and that we acknowledge it, that we actually know when something isn't right according to Elohim's law and doctrine. This is how we filter What's right and wrong is according to Elohim's law and the fruits of the Spirit. If it's not according to those, then we know it's not the right thing to do, and it's not the right spirit to be giving yourself over to. So we have a grounds to tell us what is right and what is wrong and for us not to go according to our own understanding. We should get, be able to get to the point where in all scenarios, we can think of a scripture or we can think of a fruit of the spirit that, would, that we would need to operate in. That's where we want to get to. Uh, can we continue in um, Sirach 15 and 20 so that we can see that Allah is not the minister of sin? So we just want to have a precept to, to back that up. Please, Brother Casa. 
Sirach 15 and 20. He hath commanded no man to do wickedly, neither hath he given any man license to sin. All right. So he had not supported anyone to sin. Allah is not an enabler for someone to do evil or to do wrong. So he gives no man license to sin. He commanded no one to do wickedly. He didn't give us a path in his grace to do evil. But he gave grace so that we could have the time we need to actually stop sinning. Can we jump over to Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, please, Kasif? Sure. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Allah forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? All right. So you see, as Paul is speaking, he said, how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because we're supposed to we're supposed to kill sin in our body. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we continue in sin because we have a grace period and we have time? That's the question. Because you've been given this grace of time, Should we put stopping sinning on the back burner? Should we wait to the last minute like we probably done in our, our school work or what we done in, in high school or college? Wait to the last minute and try to get the work done because we know the deadline? Now, in this regard, we don't know the deadline. But many of us have been programmed to wait to the last minute instead of seizing the opportunity that we have today. And though we don't know the deadline, we're gonna push. We're gonna push what they what they say, push the envelope. We're gonna wait till we feel it's time or the last minute, or when things get bad and we get scared, then we're gonna start trying to work on it. But that don't always work. Because the moment when you get scared could be the end. And this isn't a fear thing. This is a real life thing. Because no man know of the time when the grace period is over. We know similar to to where it would be completely over for everyone. But individually, no man know of when that grace period is over for an individual. Everybody's not going to make it to the wilderness. And that's just, that's just factual. So why take Allah Hayyam's grace for granted, not knowing when that grace period may be over for you? And this is why if we continue sinning because of grace, instead of learning to do right so grace can abound and be successful in that grace period, we will rebuild the sinful man in ourselves that Christ died to destroy and save us from. And many of us won't even build to get away from the sinful man 
that Christ died to destroy and save us from in, in some cases. Seeing it's his will for us to be baptized, receiving the seal from doing well in the grace period. He wants to see what we're going to do, just like we read at in the beginning of the lesson where Elohim said, I will hope that they will repent. And if they don't, then I will judge them. He's waiting to see what we're going to do in the grace period. Wanting to see that we're actually going to take the initiative and change. And why is that? Why is that? Christ came to do what? Can we jump over to Romans 6 and 3, Costa, please? Romans 6 oh, and 3. Continue, excuse me. It's all good. <laughs> Romans 6 and 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Yahweh Christ, were baptized into his death? So we're supposed to die to our flesh and desires as he destroys sin in the sinful flesh. So when he was baptized, many of us, we were baptized into his death. When he died, he died for us. And his blood that was shed was to destroy the sinful man in us. That was the purpose of it. Or give us a chance to destroy the sinful man in us. Can you continue reading, please, Casa? Verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Right. So, we are buried with him by baptism into death. So, when we get baptized, we're actually supposed to be completely putting on the yoke of of Yache. We should be walking in the newness of life after baptism. And this grace period gives us time to actually get ourselves in a place where we have these good habits of keeping the commandments and bringing forth fruits of the Spirit. And we're sealing, we're sealing those good habits with baptism. That's why after baptism, they would receive the seal of the Holy Spirit because they had already done the work to get to a place where they were actually keeping the commandments and bringing forth fruits of the Spirit. And when they got to that place, they go and get the baptism so that they can partake in the newness of life and receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, that they have completed the task. Then they continue walking in it. This is the process. Cousin, can you read Romans 12 and 2, please? Yes, Romans 12 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Allah. Right. right. So during the grace period, we're supposed to be working on changing our minds to be in agreement with the good and perfect will of Allah in the law. If we don't do that and remain in our desires, we are not ready for baptism. And if we go back to our sins after baptism, we're rebuilding a vessel of sin and weren't truly rooted in good works to fall into a worse case than we were in before. Because as y'all remember in Matthew, it says seven more spirits come. So if you go through the process 
to keep the commandments, learn all the commandments, implement all the commandments, bring forth fruits of the spirit. You know, went through the whole process. And then you go and get baptized. All I am going to know, because if you didn't receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, then you know you actually didn't complete it. And that would mean that you got baptized before the time. Because then that means you wouldn't be rooted in good works and you will fall back into a worst case. Because you were baptized unworthily. This is why I, 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 me personally, I stress not rushing to get baptized. Because I understand what baptism is. And if you rush to go get baptized, it's going to make your walk harder. Because more evil spirits are going to be attacking you. Uh, can we jump over to Galatians 2 and 18, please, Captain? Sure. Galatians 2 and 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. All right. So if I, if I stay in my sins... Even after being baptized and believing on the name, I make myself a transgressor. As Paul said, it's not possible to be justified by Christ being found in sin. So if I'm building again the thing that I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor because I'm building sin. Continue, Brother Casa, please. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto Allah. I am. So through the law of sacrifices, Christ sacrificed himself so that we can be dead to the law of sacrifices for sins, since it didn't purge our conscience, so that his own blood sacrifice can purge our conscience from the guilt holding us back to go forward without fear of judgment or fear that we can't do right by trusting Allah Hayim's process to work righteousness by faith in the grace we have been given to grow. Here we jump over to Romans 5 and 21, please, Kasa. Romans 5 and 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Yahshua Christ our Lord. The law of sacrifices could not help us to get to righteousness because of the guilty conscience and the devil weighing us down with his fear that we can't do it or fearing to make the necessary mistakes in the learning process or fearing to let go of our desires because of the pleasure in them. So we continue sinning unto death. So Christ had to die according to the law of sacrifices so we can know his true love for us. And believe in it to get to the grace to learn in righteousness without those fears that grace may reign through the righteous works unto life by faith instead of sin reigning through fear unto death. Christ isn't the minister of sin or an enabler of it. As he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he wants us to believe in him, his father and the Holy Spirit and love them, showing that love by doing righteousness, so that the grace we've been given may abound and bring forth fruit of good works by not living in our sins anymore, or having the pleasure in them by working daily to overcome them, and the pleasure in them which exalts Allah grace. Our righteousness could never come by the blood of animal sacrifices to atone for our sins and justify us, because the sacrifices were just to teach us about what Christ would come to do. It was a foreshadowing of things to come. The animal sacrifices was supposed to make us feel something. 
It was to make us feel and see that something had to something had to go through affliction because of what we're doing. It was to bring us to a realization that that the things that we do affect something or somebody in some way. And many of us couldn't see it. We would go, we would sacrifice that animal and not think twice about it. Like, okay, that's, that's what I need to do so that so I don't have that guilty conscience of doing it no more. But never really taking it to heart that Yache is in that animal. His spirit is in everything. Yache is dying every time I have to kill an animal. That's why animal sacrifice could never purge the conscience. It didn't change the perspective. Council, can we continue in Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 through 25, please? Sure. Galatians 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. All right. So we aren't under the law of sacrifices to be justified in atonement for our former sins, because faith in Christ justifies us for atonement for our past sins. That's not the end of justifications, though, because work and righteousness going forward to do the law is what justifies us from the day that we believe going forward until the day of judgment. Now, it's very interesting. It says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. This is where we actually learn good and evil. We don't learn good and evil or no good and evil for ourselves. And that was a lie. The devil did that so that we could follow him. He wasn't referring to Elohim. He said, you were no good and evil for yourself. But that he flipped everything upside down because he knew that we were going to cleave unto iniquity. That's why he poured upon lust on the fruit. So you can see how the law being our schoolmaster, us learning the law, we actually learn good and evil from Elohim. And by learning good and evil from Elohim, it brings us unto Christ. And because we actually did that and took those steps to actually learn good and evil from Elohim, we're justified because we believe that his way is right, which gives us faith. But after that faith has come, but after we have that faith and we understand good and evil from Elohim, we are no longer under a schoolmaster because it said it was going to bring us unto Christ. So now we're going to bring forth fruit because we understand good and evil from Elohim. In Yache, in Christ, we're going to be able to do all things through him because he's going to strengthen us. Because we're going to hold fast to the law and understanding the distinction between the good and evil according to Elohim. And we're going to be prospered by Elohim. Now, this is where we this is where we have to grow. 
and know ourselves and focus on ourselves. Because we're going to we're going to go into Romans chapter 3 verse 23 through 26 and it's going to explain or expound that we're all in the same place. We're all in the same boat. We all, it just depends on the decisions that we make going forward. And we can't compare ourselves to one another because that would leave us right where we are. And we actually wouldn't grow. Constant, can we read Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 26, please? Sure. Romans 3. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of Allah, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Yache, whom Allah has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of Allah to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justify of him which believeth in Yahweh. All right, thank you. So belief in Christ justifies for the sins that are past. He's going to forgive those. Yet going forward from that day we believe, we have to actually do the law to be justified in the day of judgment to come. So he justifies our past sins. I'm not going to hold that against you. This is where we all have sinned and come short of the glory of Allah. But it's about what you do from that day going forward. And that right there, that distinguishes us whether we're going to take accountability for our actions, learn of Allah and implement things to actually change and to take advantage of the grace period that we're given, or we're going to sit right there and say, everybody's sinned. Everybody's come short of the glory of Allah So what does it matter if I sin? Two different mindsets. One, one's going to be justified through the grace and the redemption of Christ Yache. And the other is going to fall into judgment. Because there's no excuse that Allah is going to allow you to give to justify you staying in sin. You know, we're going to see that coming up. Let's see. Um, let's continue in Romans 2 and 11 and 12. Casa, please. Romans 2 and 11. For there is no respect of persons with Allah. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. Right. So Allah is not a respect of persons. He's going to judge according to your works. And that's it. Actions are weighed by Allah. And if you didn't take the time to actually learn the law in your life, you're going to perish. You're going to perish without having the opportunity because you didn't seize the opportunity. There's no respect of persons for it to matter what race we are. If we believe on Christ, then go forward in life thinking we don't have to keep the law, we'll be judged as lawless and perish for living without law. So you see how ignorance is not bliss. You have to get the understanding and only by the understanding and truth will you make it to 
salvation. Can you continue, Brother Casa, please? And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And if we believe we have to keep the law after believing in Christ, but don't actually do it, being hearers only of the law, or repeating the law only, but not doing it, we'll be judged by the law still for the laws we didn't uphold, as transgressing it in one point is an offense to it all. So if we actually don't keep all of it. It's as if we didn't do it at all. Because it has to be a complete change. Because we don't understand, but all the laws of Elohim is keeping us from an evil spirit. So if we offend in one law, that means that one evil spirit still had a place in our vessel. And that evil spirit is going to attest against us in our day of judgment, in the day that we give up the spirit. Uh, can we jump to James chapter 2, verse 10, Casa, please? James 2 and 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. all right. So Israel that believes in Christ had to keep the whole law. And the Gentiles that believe have to keep the laws of their father Noah. All of us that call upon Christ and believe in him have to be doers of the law before Elohim. Right? So this is why even in the New Testament, when they were referring to the Gentiles, they said the Gentiles have Moses read in the synagogue every Sabbath. They have to learn as well. Could we jump over to Romans chapter 2, verse 13 and 16, please, Cousin? Romans 2 and 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before Allah, but the doers of the law shall be justified. In the day when Allah shall judge the secrets of men by Yahshua Christ, according to my gospel. All right. So we'll see everybody is going to be just according to the gospel of so Paul. Right, so not the hearers of the law are justified before Allah, but the doers of the law. So you actually have to hear it and do it. And that is putting it into your heart and not taking it lightly. Or thinking that your way is better than Allah. So you see the justification after belief comes from doing the law to be justified in the judgment, not just believing. Faith was the beginning of the process, and the grace to learn and do righteousness gets us through the process unto love. Because we know love is the end. Charity is the end of the commandment for them that believe. Can we read the letter of Ignatius to the Ephesians chapter 14 verse 1, please? Ignatius to the Ephesians chapter 14 verse 1. None of these things is hidden from you, if ye be perfect in your faith and love toward Yahshua Christ. For these are the beginning and end of life. Faith is the beginning and love is the end. So you see, it starts with faith. And through our faith, our works will come unto love. And when we attain to combine faith and love with our righteous works, holding things together, where does it bring us? And the two being found in unity are Allah while all things else follow in their train unto true nobility. So the purpose Christ gave himself and Allah sent him was to bring us back to them through upholding faith and love through doing the law and every other good spirit and work of Allah follows the powerful spirits of faith, the hard worker, and love, the spirit most like her mother, the Holy Spirit, that never fails and its greatest of the daughters of Allah. Can we continue on to verse 2, please, Cousin? Verse 2. No man professing faith sinneth, and no man possessing love hateth. Right. So this ties back to the fact we discussed sinning as hatred to our souls and others 
So no man in faith and love walks in hatred or sins. Uh, continue, Casa, please. The tree is manifest from its fruit. So they that profess to be Christ shall be seen through their actions. For the work is not a thing of profession now, but is seen then when one is found in the power of faith unto the end. Right. So that means it's not about what we profess with our mouth, but what works we work to bring forth fruit unto the end of our life. Because we have to actually be doers of the law by faith to be justified, like Paul said in the judgment. So if we don't forget the commands and the calling of the gospel to do the law and bind faith and love together in unity to join us unto Elohim, we will be blessed. All right? So let us not forget the command and the calling of the gospel to do the law, to bind faith and love together in unity. All right? Uh, can we jump over to James chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, please, Casa? Yes. James 1, verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. All right, so he forgets the grace he hath been given to make the changes, and the mission to make it unto love through his faith by righteousness. Right? And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to forget the grace that was given. I'll continue, Casa. Verse 24. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Right. So he sees himself. He sees his wrongs. Then he goes his way, and straightway forgetteth the wrongs that he does, and continues in them. So he forgets the sinful man. And, and if that's the case, that he was actually baptized, he would be forgetting the sinful man that he got baptized to destroy. Or he is supposed to be working to overcome, to prepare his heart for baptism and goes about life, continuing to rebuild that transgressor he was supposed to have destroyed. Or he continues in his transgression because of the pleasure he has in them or the fear he has about the work it takes to come out of them, fearing to humble himself and take on whatever it takes to overcome. All right, so this is why he was talking about beholding his natural face in the glass. He'll see himself for a moment, and then he'll forget what manner of man he is. And this is why we have to remember and have to confess our faults. You have to be quick to, to repent and confess your faults when something is revealed or shown unto you so that you can actually turn from it. You don't want to continue in it and forget that you actually have a problem or feel that you've already overcome the problem because you acknowledged it. Acknowledgement alone doesn't, doesn't overcome a desire or a pleasure. It's the start of overcoming a desire or a pleasure by acknowledging it, but then you have to actually put in the work to overcome it. Right? So don't let deceit or, or a lie cause that evil spirit to dwell within your temple with you thinking that you've overcame it already. Right? Because you always have to be on guard for it. It's a constant battle. Every day you have to be on guard for whatever may come upon you to stay in the fruits of the Spirit and the law. That's our duty. Uh, you don't mind continuing, Brother Castle. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen. The man who values the grace period and liberty, he hath been taken advantage of the opportunity to learn and do the word intently, work in righteousness to get perfect in love. He will be blessed in the judgment. 
From old time, work and righteousness was always showing our faith by keeping the commandments to express our love unto Allah. Hayyam. And that's how Allah Hayyam receives our love. When we talk about love languages, Allah Hayyam is acts of service. That means you actually have to, to do it. Yes, he likes gifts, oblations, right? Gifts, acts of service. Um, what are some of the other five love languages? Um, I think he's really about acts of service because he said, yeah, he definitely. Said, he said actions is how we wait, and he didn't ask our fathers for any sacrifices. Right. <laughs> so, so. Well, he, 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 you, yes, acts of service, but he also does like oblations, like to actually, um, to like dedicate something or to bring a an um any type of offering because in Surat it talks about how um keeping the commandments is offerings enough. So it actually is an oblation. It is a gift to do acts of service. And also um it was some other ones in Surat. Um yeah. Yeah, it talks about offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving. So praising him, thanking him. Yeah. So all those oblations. Let's see if I don't pull it up since I brought it up. Um, uh, it's a rock 35 and 1. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. He that requiteth a good turn offers fine flour. So these are all oblations. So he definitely likes gifts. He that giveth alms sacrifices praise. To depart from wickedness is a thing pleasing to the Lord, and to forsake unrighteousness is a propitiation. Thou shalt not appear empty before the Lord. So you you better bring your, your works to as a gift. Oh, so our actions are spiritual sacrifices, the spiritual mm -hmm. offense. Yeah. So the the acts of service and gifts technically they, they can intertwine with one another. You got you did you have something, Casa? Um, you basically spec on it because he said Paul talked about offering spiritual sacrifices and you just talked about it. Our actions and also our thanksgiving with good actions is um oblations. That's his love language. Praise mm -hmm. Allah. Can we jump over to uh, Deuteronomy 6 and 24, please? Yes. Deuteronomy 6 and 24. And Ahaya commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Ahaya our Allah for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. So he wants to preserve us alive, to fulfill our days in this life, to keep us alive in the judgment, when souls will get killed in hell for not doing right. So he's trying to make sure that that doesn't happen to us. Continue, Kase, if you don't mind, please. Verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Ahaya, our Allah as he hath commanded us. So see that work in righteousness by faith to show our faith in and fear of Allah has always been the true calling to overcome sin. As the law of sacrifices could not purge our hearts from sin against Allah weighing us down with guilt since only righteousness cast out sin and the hatred that causes us to do it. And faith in Christ is the first step in righteousness for them to be cast out. Then working righteousness keeps them out as love grows stronger in us through obedience. 
right, can we jump over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1 and verse 4, please, Casa? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereon too perfect. Verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So the law of sacrificing and offering animal blood can't purge our hearts from the guilt of former sins so we can move forward. Only belief in Christ's blood and his sacrifice could do that. Can we read Galatians 2 and 21, please? Galatians 2 and 21. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If the animal sacrificial law could purge the conscience of former sins by faith in it, Christ would have died in vain. But it can't, so he didn't die in vain, as his blood actually purges us from former sins to overcome the guilt of them to work on change without fear. Also, he didn't die in vain because he did it intently out of love for us so we could have a clear conscience to go forward and keep his law out of love for him, willing to go through whatever it takes to show our love like he did for us. Can we jump to uh, John chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, please? Then verse 12 after. Sure. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So he wants us to lay down our sinful life, to die to our fleshly desires by loving according to the law for each other's sakes and his sake as he laid down his life and keeping the law to overcome the flesh for us. Love is all he asks of us. So you see, he's not asking us to literally die. He's telling us to die to our sins. He's not even asking us for what he did. Because he's thinking upon others. He's not being selfish. He's being selfless. And that's how you distinguish love. If someone's selfish, that's hatred. If someone's selfless, that's love. It's very, very dry cut. Can we read on Romans 13 and 10, please, Casa? Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Mm -hmm. So love worketh no ill to his neighbor because love is selfless. If love was selfish, then it would work ill to his neighbor. But we know that that's hatred. And love will lead us to fulfill the commands of the law, doing nothing that will harm our neighbor in hatred. So you see how it's tied together? Can we read Romans 13 and 9, please, Cousin? Romans 13 and 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So all the commandments Allah I am ordained is simply put in just saying, love thy neighbor as ourself. That's Christ's will for us to keep his law and the law of the Father to love each other. And we are accountable to perform it unto them as a debt owed since we were bought with the price of Elohim's son's blood. 
All right, Costa, let's jump over to First Corinthians 6 and 20, please. First Corinthians 6 and 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify Allah in your body and in your spirit, which are Allah Haim's. We know this now, so we have to prepare ourselves and focus on the work at hand, because in the end we'll be punished if we don't pay our debt in full to do our Lord's will who purchased us. Can we jump over to Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, please? Luke chapter 12, verse 47. And the servant, which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So Israel was given the law, so more stripes are for the children of Israel. Right. So they knew the Lord's will and they didn't prepare themselves. Allah forbid. So Allah willing, we prepare ourselves in this, in this grace period. Go ahead, Brother Kasa. Verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Right. So that's the Gentiles who believe but weren't given the law. So their punishment isn't as severe, yet they'll be punished nonetheless. All right. Continue, Kasa, please. For unto... Whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So everyone who has been given the grace to believe in Christ is required to fulfill the debt of work and righteousness as Allah asks of us to attain unto love through faith. Allah gave great grace, so we can't take this opportunity lightly. No one will be judged by them. And no animal sacrifice can atone for not keeping the commandments in the end. All right. Can we jump over to Hebrews 10 and 26 through 28, please? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay. So that's the law of sin and death we have been made free from through faith in Christ to have liberty to grow out of our sins. All right, let's jump over to Romans 8 and 2, please. Romans 8 and 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Yahweh hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So that punishment under Moses was severe without mercy. Where you sin, you die by men's hands. Yet now we have mercy from Christ to have more time when we fall to grow and get it right. All right. So this is where we don't want to take Elohim's grace for granted. All right. Should we sin so that grace may abound? Allah forbid. John chapter 1, verse 17, please, Cassie. John 1 and 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Yahweh Christ. So now we are not in the hands of men, but in Allah hands. So that means if we don't do right, it would be a worse punishment than that we received under the law of judgment for sins given by Moses, because the blood that was shed wasn't merely animals like Moses did, but Allah son's blood. So the severity is worse for not taking advantage of the opportunity now and taking it for granted. Let's jump to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the son of Allah, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? Right. So consider how much worse it's going to be for us if we count the blood of Christ that was shed to be an unholy thing and show our hatred toward Allah to continue in our sins, though it was shed so the spirit of grace could be given to help us. 
That's an interesting dichotomy to see. Continue, please, Brother Casa. Verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living, Allah Hayyim. So the difference with the law of liberty and grace versus the law of judgment for sins of old time under Moses is that now the congregation of the church is not the one that's going to kill us when we're doing wrong, but Allah Hayyim is the one that's going to judge us when we continue doing wrong and frustrate the grace that we've been given to learn to do right. Now, although the church can, um, can put someone out of the church or out of the congregation for their sin, we're not judging the person according to their sin. That's Allah Hayyam's job. Ahaya is Allah, and he will reward us according to our way in the end of our life. Yahweh, the angel in the wilderness with Moses, showed Moses this of old time. Can we read Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, please? Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of Ahaya before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Well, Yahweh is gracious to whom he wills and merciful to whom he wills, as his father is. All right? So that's why when we were speaking about earlier in the lesson, how it's actually Allah Hayyim that's actually turning us from our sins. This is his mercy, and this is his grace, because we wouldn't turn from our sins. That's why we that's why we cleaved unto them. So let's see the name or character of his father that he will proclaim. Can we jump over to Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, please, Brother Casa? Sure. Exodus 34 and 6. And Ahaya passed before him and proclaimed, Ahaya, Ahaya Allah, merciful and gracious long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So he always had gracious mercy with him to give those who he knew would love him time to grow. Continue, Casa, please. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. He always reserved judgment after the time of his long suffering for those whom he knew would not come out of hatred towards him. Ahai is good, truly yet he won't clear the guilty who frustrate his grace by any means when we stay in our iniquity despite his spirit of grace and sacrifice of his own son. It truly is a fearful thing to fall into his hands as he controls all things. Can we read Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, please, Cousin? Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no Allah I am with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So he really controls all things, have an influence over and, and in everything. This is what Allah means. The controlling power or force. They three are Aloha, which are the controlling force of the powers or Alahayim the controlling forces of powers of the land and seas or life as we flesh and blood creatures come from sea and land as well. If we frustrate the grace we've been given to continue in our sins, there will come a time when the sentence will go forth to end our life because Allah Hayyam sees we truly won't repent. And that's not what we want for anyone. 
Because Allah I am hath no pleasure in him that dieth. And we don't have no pleasure to see anyone die either. So we're standing here teaching this lesson by the grace of Allah I am for others to not take the grace for granted that we actually live unto Allah I am. Katha, can we read the second Edris chapter 7, verse 78, please? Sure. Second Ezra chapter 7, verse 78. Now concerning death, the teaching is, when the decisive decree has gone out from the Most High, that a person shall die, as the spirit leaves the body to return again to him who gave it, first of all, it adores the glory of the Most High. All right. Now the glory of the Most High is the light people talk about when dying. Notice the sentence goes forth from the Most High, Allah Ahaya, for a man to die. So he truly kills and makes alive, as he himself said. This is why it's fearful to fall into his hands, as he can take our life in this world and kill our soul after this life. He truly has the power to do both. All right. Can we jump over to Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, please? Let's see what Yache says about, uh, about Ahaya, man. Go ahead. Yeah, I almost said Yache. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matthew 10 and 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Right. So that's the one you want to fear. A man can take your life. A man can take your flesh. He can kill your flesh, but he can't kill your soul. Right? So it's, it's more important to fear him who has control over both. Because if it's, if a man takes your life, Allah Haim decreed it. So it's truly Allah Haim who has control over everything. So there's no reason to fear what a man can do to you because a man can only fulfill the will of Allah I am. we have an example of how this happens in our lives this sentence of dying when an opportunity of grace to change is over happened to Ahab so we have examples so when Ahia saw he wasn't going to change after 22 years of bearing with him, Ahia counseled to lead him to his end. So Allah was long suffering. Allah bared with Ahab for 22 years before he actually cast judgment upon him. So, and we don't know how long the grace is going to be toward us. So this is why we, it's, it, it would be wise for us to, to walk in his counsel now. And not to take his grace for granted. Uh, Kasa, can we read 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 20 through 22, please? Yes. 1 Kings 22, verse 20. And Nahiah said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before Ahiah and said, I will persuade him. And Ahia said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth, and do so. All right, so we see the proclamation came from Elohim. So you see, it's Elohim who actually sent the spirit to go forth to set up Ahab, because his grace period was over. So no spirit gets authority to destroy us without Allah consent. And when he decrees it, there is no escape in his hands. That's why in Matthew it said, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. See that these things are true by what happened to Ahab. And to this day, they hold true the same thing. As you may recall from the story of Ahab, 
that he got hit with a random arrow. So there truly is no deliverance out of the hands of Elohim when we fall into his hands for not using his opportunity of grace to repent and do right. To this day, we die in random events, not understanding it was from Elohim for our works and unrighteousness. If we hadn't done what was right unto him. So we don't have that same sense of of spirituality that they had in times of old where they knew all things came from Elohim and his decree. We look at things as if they just happened by chance, but that's not true. All things happen according to Elohim's will. So it's always something to gain from something happening because it's usually for someone to get an admonishment or a chastisement or correction about if something bad happens. Can we jump over to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, please, Kassim? Sure. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. So we die for our own sins, not what someone else did. And there is no excuse or license for us to sin when others do wrong. And that's one of the major things that causes a stumbling block for many of for many of us. That when other people do wrong, we use it as an excuse or a license to sin for ourselves. Instead of upholding the faith. And walking and doing what's right according to Elohim. Continue, Brother Costa, please. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. All right. So we die for our own sins, and we can live because of our own righteousness and performing the law by faith and love, too, no matter what someone else is doing. Right. So the righteous works that we do unto Elohim can actually save us. Abigail is an example in that she lived for doing right, but her husband died in his sins. But even after Christ's sacrifice and believing in it, if we continue to do wrong for our own desires like Ananias and have respect the persons to partake in someone else's sin like Sapphira, his wife in the New Testament, if we don't repent, we will eventually get taken away as they did. So there's no time like the present to take the opportunity to do the work to come out of desires and respect the persons to do right no matter what. Right? So we have to overcome that respect the persons or judging ourselves based off of what others are doing and not upholding the standard of Elohim. Can we continue in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21 through 23, Brother Costa, please? Sure. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sin that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he had done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Saith the Lord Ahaya. And not that he should return from his ways and live? So we use his grace period to change. We will live no matter what past we come from. Yet when we get to doing right, we have to stick with it, upholding faith and love and unity through righteousness unto the end and not fall back to our former desires. Continue, Brother Casa. Verse 24. But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, 
in them shall he die. So even when we get to where we're walking in love through righteousness by our faith, we have to be steadfast and continue in it until the end, or else we will also die in our sins for frustrating the grace we have been given. Things haven't changed, just like Ahab was led to his death by a lion spirit and a random event happening. Demons still get understanding of when someone is ordained to leave this world, and they go about and cause some random event to get people taken out of this life. Let's look at this scenario with Solomon hearing a father's complaint against his son to get him killed, to see that judgment belongs to Elohim and always has belonged to him. Can we jump into the Testament of Solomon chapter 110 through 112, please? Yes. Testament of Solomon chapter 110. And behold, in those days, one of the workmen of ripe old age threw himself down before me and said, King Solomon, pity me because I am old. So I bade him stand up and said, Tell me, O man, all you will. And he answered, I beseech you, king, I have an only born son, and he insults and beats me openly, and plucks out the hair of my head, and threatens me with a painful death. Therefore, I beseech you, avenge me. Now the law is that the son who sets light his parents and smites his parents should die by men. Yet vengeance is the Lord's, remember, so the father's heart isn't upright either for seeking vengeance rather than seeking a witness to convince his son to repent. So let's see what happens. Continue, Pastor, please. And I, Solomon, on hearing this, felt compunction as I looked at his old age. And I bade the child to be brought to me. And when he was brought, I questioned him whether it were true. And the youth said, I was not so filled with madness so as to strike my father with my hand. Be kind to me, O king, for I have not dared to commit such impiety, poor wretch that I am. So he didn't deny insulting and threatening him, but spake on the fact that he doesn't actually physically abuse him. So that's impious in his sight, while insulting him is an fault to him. He didn't see any shame in it. And he's actually being very, very uh, deceiving. Because he stonewalled in a way by not answering to the other things, but speaking on what he didn't do to save his face or to seem well in, in King Solomon's sight. He is still worthy of death for the insults and threats, though, by the law. Let's see how it plays out. Let's see. Continue, Brother Casa, please. But I, Solomon, on hearing this from the youth, exhorted the old man to reflect on the matter and accept his son's apology. So Solomon sought to apply grace and truth. All right, continue, Casa. However, he would not, but said he would rather let him die. All right. So the father was unforgiving and desirous of his son to die in his hatred for him. So he made the story to sound horrible to convince Solomon to kill him instead of just telling what happened simply in truth. And we know that uh, according to the spirit of hatred, it makes small things great. And he was lying. So we can see that hatred in it in the heart of the of the father toward his son. And we can actually see, according to the testimonies, how that hatred is operating through this story to actually see that the spirits and the understanding that Elohim gives us on these things is true. And it yields true. Go ahead, Brother Costa. And as the old man would not yield. I was about to pronounce sentence on the youth when I saw Ornias the demon laughing. All right. 
So he was about to be judged. He was about to judge for the young man to be put to death according to the judgment of the law of Moses. So let's see why the demon is laughing, knowing Elohim is the judge of all. Continue, Brother Costa. I was very angry at the demons laughing in my presence. And I ordered my men to remove the other parties and bring forward or nice before my tribunal. And when he was brought before me, I said to him, A cursed one, why didst thou look at me and laugh? And the demon answered, Prithee, king, it was not because of thee I laughed, but because of this ill-starred old man and the wretched youth, his son. Mm -hmm. So both men were wrong in the situation. The demon knew it. And the demon knew that Solomon was even getting into his emotions. So he had all three of them. Continue, Brother Casa. For after three days, his son will die untimely. And lo, the old man desires to foully make away with him. Right. So he's like, after three days, the kid has already had the proclamation from Elohim to die. And the old man wants to make away with him. And it's going to cause the old man to sin too by by putting the youth to death according to his own desires. So then it will be a sin upon the old man and the son. So you see, Elohim had already pronounced his judgment of the situation, seeing that though the son had set light his father and insults him, and wasn't confessing that fault because of his pleasure in it. He wasn't he wasn't coming to repentance. Continue, Brother Costa, please. But I, Solomon, having heard this, said to the demon, Is that true that thou speakest? And he answered, It is true, O king. And I, on hearing that, bade them remove the demon, and that they should again bring before me the old man with his son, I bade them make friends with one another again, and I supplied them with food. So Solomon operated in grace and truth of the law, desiring them to make peace with one another and mercy of heart towards one another. All right. So let's see what's going to happen. Continue, Brother Castle. And then I told the old man after three days to bring his son again to me here. And I said, I will attend to him. And they saluted me and went their way. All right. So if the son didn't repent and truly change, he was going to be judged after three days. The son truly didn't repent and died randomly like the demon saw the judgment of Elohim was. So we can know judgment truly belongs to Elohim to remove us from this life or save us in this life. Let's look and see the confirmation that judgment comes from Elohim. And then random acts happen in the world by demons to take us out of this life when we take grace for granted, not appreciating his patience and holiness and bearing with us all the time of our life. Let's continue, Brother Costa, please. Chapter 113. And when they were gone, I ordered Onias to be brought forward and said to him, Tell me how you know this. And he answered, We demons ascend into the firmament of heaven and fly about among the stars, and we hear the sentences which go forth upon the souls of men. So they hear when the Most High gives the sentence for a soul to die in this world. So this is that's part of why they sit in the firmament, so they can listen. All right? Go ahead, Brother Custom. And forthwith we come, and whether by force of influence or by fire, or by sword, or by some accident, we veil our act of destruction. So you see, when the random event or something happens for someone to leave this world, it's demons that influence it to destroy the soul, hiding their works by making it look like it was a random, untimely accident that happened when they truly did it intently, knowing the sentence was pronounced on that soul for their life to end. The demons cover it up so that so that people won't know it's them that did it by some random accident or random event mishap that happens to a person 
and we aren't taught about demons and spiritual activity behind what happens in the world. So we think it's just wrong place, wrong time type situations or some coincidence. Not understanding it was from Elohim's sentence that the demons acted on to destroy the soul and the soul dies because Elohim willed it to be so as the course of that person's life, which was due to come to an end because the grace period had elapsed. Continue, Brother Casa, please, unless you have something. No, you. That's it. Okay. And if a man does not die by some untimely disaster or by violence, then we demons transform ourselves in such a way as to appear to men and be worshipped in our human nature. So they either kill the person who was ordained to die by some random act, or get them to go further into idolatry by worshiping them, which would eventually lead them to death. Or if the person hasn't sinned to the point where they're not going to turn from their lust to be condemned to death, the demon would come to deceive them to worship and follow idols. So they're, they're working all the time. Even if it's not it's, even if it's not the time for you to go, they're going to work. So I said, if a man does not die by some untimely disaster or by violence, right? So if it's not, if it's not proclaimed upon him to die, then we demons transform ourselves in such a way to appear to men and be worshipped in our human nature. So that can... That can go so many different ways. It can go into the seizure of Bojera. It can go into so many, so many different things that these demons have actually been worshipped in their human nature. And it's big, especially when you get into like Hindu or you get into like certain um, Christian faiths where they have all those different saints and all these different people that they actually follow um, Christendom. Um, Islam does it. Um, Hinduism does it. I mean, pretty much every religion. These are these demons that are being worshipped as humans and they're, and they're human, they're being worshipped in their human nature. So when the soul dies, though it may not know their secret fault that led to it, talking about the, the demon, the person who dies gets to see exactly why they were dying in the time of their death, so they know it wasn't happening without reason. Right? So the person actually gets to see why they died because all their works come before their face. Um, can we look at the Apocalypse of Paul 14 so we can see that, Brother Carson, please? Apocalypse of Paul 14. And he said to me, look again down on the earth and watch the soul of an impious man going out of the body, which vexed the Lord day and night, saying, I know nothing else in this world. I eat and drink and enjoy what is in the world. For who is there who has descended into hell? And descending has declared to us that there is judgment there. So he didn't believe in Christ or Elohim or the testimony of the judgment to come. All right, continue, Cousin. And again, I looked carefully, and I saw all the scorn of the sinner and all that he did and they stood together before him in the hour of need. And it was done to him in that hour in which he was threatened about his body at the judgment. And he said, it were better for me if I had not been born. So the wrongs we do, or anyone that dies, um, or the right things you do are shown to you. Right. So the wrongs you do are shown in the hour of your death. And we are and we are clearly shown that we didn't use our time and our body wisely. 
as the threats we receive from the evil angels about our body at the judgment. We may think we are right in our own perspective, like the man thought he didn't have anything to worry about. And in his scorn, no one could tell him anything, but Allah truly weighs the spirits around us and judges us according to the ones we walk in and the ones we walk with. So Allah sees everything spiritually. He knows that by the works that we wrought depends on what spirits we, we cleave ourselves unto. And these same spirits are going to be there in our time of need when we die. In the moment when we die, they're going to be standing right there seeing whose spirit we have in us. Um, can we read Proverbs 16 and 2, please, Brother Constant? Sure. Proverbs 16 and 2. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but Ahaya weigheth the spirits. Right. And that's how he's able to distinguish what's going on with us. What, what do we cleave unto in our life? Did we actually keep his commandments? Because his commandments and the fruits of the spirit would have delivered us from all evil spirits dwelling in our vessel. But if we actually didn't keep the commandments and bring forth fruits of the spirit, then those evil spirits would be in us. And it's a very clear distinction for Elohim because it's not about personal feelings. It's not about how he feels about something. That's, that's men. Men, we make that mistake. And we base things off of how we feel or how, or how we see it. But Allah bases all things off of spirits, our actions, what works we bring forth. Because what spirits we're cleaving unto and allowing to cleave unto us are what actions we're going to bring forth because those spirits are going to operate in us. So those very spirits that helped us frustrate Elohim grace will meet us at the firmament and afflict us. So they're going to be there when you die in your time of need. And they're also going to be in the firmament before you go into the first heaven to see what spirits are in you. Can we continue, Brother Casa, please? Apocalypse of Paul 14. After these things... There came at the same time the holy angels and the malign. And the soul of the sinner and the holy angels did not find a place in it. So when dying, the holy and evil angels come to see which side has place in us, whether good or evil. So it's no in-between serving both good and evil when we die, because the holy ones don't find place in us when the evil ones have a place in us, right? That's why the Holy Spirit can't dwell in the vessel that is subject to sin. So now you get to understand the Holy Spirit flees and those evil spirits take habitation. Continue, Brother Casa, if you don't mind. Moreover, the malign angels cursed it. And when they had drawn it out of the body. So evil angels threaten us and curse us and pull us out of our body if evil is found in us. Continue, Kasa. The angels admonished it a third time, saying, O wretched soul, look upon thy flesh whence thou comest out, for it is necessary that thou shouldest return to thy flesh in the day of resurrection that thou mayest receive the due for thy sins and thy impieties. So the evil angels that lead us in our life actually threaten us when, we, when we're dying. And when we die, they draw out our soul out of the body, cursing us and continuing threatening us about our body and what's going to happen at the judgment for the wrongs we've done. 
So when the soul comes out of the body, there is no confusion about what awaits it in the judgment and second resurrection. Though we don't know why a person dies, the person that dies knows exactly why they're dying in that hour. And unfortunately, it's too late at that point. We see the evil angels mistreating our soul after leading us astray in our life. So you see that the evil angel leads you astray. The evil, the evil angels and demons, they lead you astray. And then when it's time for you to die, they come and they, they ridicule you. So let's see what the spirits we walk in in this life does to us. Let's continue, Brother Casa. And we're in chapter 15. It's interesting. It's like it's a practical joke to them. It is. Yeah, they're taunting you. They're like, yeah, you you, you shouldn't have listened to us. Like, we, we got you. Like, yeah. pretty much like somebody, like, when somebody has pleasure in deceiving somebody, like, They'll deceive the person, and once they feel like they actually deceive the person, they get that pleasure out of it, and they might laugh or smile because they they because they got over on you. Like they're doing the same thing, the same evil spirit. Apocalypse of Paul, chapter fifteen. And when they had led it forth, the customary angel preceded it. Now, this is the angel of righteousness who is with us all our life. He isn't escorting us, but going ahead of us because he has no place in us. Now, for the righteous, he would actually escort you. But for the impious, he's not going to escort you. He's just going to go before you and you got to pretty much find your way. And said to it, O wretched soul, I am the angel belonging to thee, relating daily to the Lord thy malign works. Whatever thou didst by night or day, and if it were in my power, not for one day would I minister to thee. But none of these things was I able to do. The judge is pitiful and just, and he himself commanded us that we should not cease to minister to the soul till you should repent. But thou hast lost the time of repentance. So see that though the soul was impious and didn't believe in Christ even, Nonetheless, the Lord was pitiful and just and gave him a space of repentance in his lifetime, not to judge him when he sinned according to the judgments of the law in hopes that he would repent and believe and turn from his wickedness to do right. Yet the decree for him to die went forth when the Lord saw his time or opportunity of repentance was over. So the grace period was over for him. Continue, Brother Costa, please. I indeed was strange to thee, and thou to me. Let us go on then to the just judge. I will not dismiss thee before I know from today why I was strange to thee. And the spirit confounded him, and the angel troubled him. Mm. So it's interesting that the even the the angel that's with you. Um, the customary angel. The customary angel wants to understand too, why did you never cleave to me? Why, why were you only cleaving to evil spirits and not cleaving to me? So even the customary angel is like is hurt. By seeing your works every day. The spirit is the portion of the of the spirit of Christ that keeps every soul alive in this world. And the angel is the same righteous angel that's taken account of the soul's deeds. Go ahead, Brother Cotton. When therefore they had arrived at the power. When he started to enter heaven, a labor was imposed upon him above all other labor. Error and oblivion and murmuring met him in the spirit of fornication and the rest of the powers. 
So the spirits that we walked in in this world meet us in the firmament to weigh us down with our iniquities that we walked in and didn't overcome. And that's for the impious. That's for them that actually didn't keep the commandments and bring forth fruits of the spirit and, and walk in them. And say it to him, oh, excuse me, my bad. That's the your part. And said to him, Whither goest thou, wretched soul? And darest thou to rush into heaven? Hold, that we may see if we have our qualities in thee, since we do not see that thou hast a holy helper. And after that I heard voices in the height of heaven, saying, Present that wretched soul to Allah Hayyam, that it may know that it is Allah Hayyam that it despised. So see that it's hatred toward Allah Hayyam as to why we didn't actually do whatever was necessary to keep his law. When we go before the Lord, all the secret sins we tried to hide or stay in will be known, and we can't talk our way out of taking accountability by deceiving Allah Hayyam like we may do to people in the world. Okay. So this is why I said, present that wretched soul to Allah Hayyam, that it may know that it is Allah Hayyam that it despised. Because how you treat people and how you go about situations and what spirits you allow to enter into your vessel just shows that you're, you're, you have a hatred or, dis, or you're despising Allah Hayyam in his way, in his law. Because you're doing contrary to him. Or them, excuse me. Go ahead, Brother Casa, please. When, therefore, it had entered heaven, all the angels saw it. A thousand thousand exclaimed with one voice, all saying, Woe to thee, wretched soul, for the sake of thy works which thou hast done on earth. What answer art thou about to give to Allah Hayyam when thou shalt have approached to adore him? The angel who was with it answered and said, Weep with me, my beloved, for I have not found rest in this soul. And the angels answered him and said, Let such a soul be taken away from the midst of ours, for from the time he entered the stink of him crosses to us angels. And after these things it was presented that it might worship in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And an angel of Allah Hayyam showed him Allah Hayyam who made him after his own image and likeness. Moreover, his angel ran before him saying, Lord Allah Almighty, I am the angel of this soul whose works I presented to thee day and night, not doing according to thy judgment. So whether we make ourselves look good to others, but don't cleanse our heart to actually work righteousness, or don't believe we have to work it, in either case, our deeds are still recorded when we don't walk in Elohim's judgments. Continue, Kasa, please. And the Spirit likewise said, I am the Spirit who dwelt in it from the time it was made. In itself, moreover, I know it and it has not followed my will. Judge it, Lord, according to thy judgment. So the Spirit's will is for us to obey Allah Hayyam. Under two witnesses, by law, under Moses, we will be put to death. In the end of our life, now being in Allah Hayyam's hands, the same law still gets us judged by two witnesses of the angel and the Spirit that is with us in our life. Continue, Kasa, please. And there came the voice of Allah Hayyam to it and said, Where is thy fruit which thou hast made worthy of the goods which thou hast received? Allah Hayyam was long suffering with us because of his patience and holiness, hoping we would repent and be converted to return unto him and do right when we realized he showed his love toward us to sacrifice his son and give us this grace period of life to change. And the first thing he wants to know from us is where's the fruits of righteousness from keeping this law to show gratitude for the good he hath given unto us. Like we saw earlier, he just required us to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with him. And in the end, 
he is still going to require these fruits from us. Notice Paul is seeing what happens to a soul who dies, and this is after Christ made the sacrifice. So doing unjustly still comes with punishment, like Paul said in his gospel, that them that live without law shall perish in their lawlessness. Like we are seeing, this impious soul is about to perish. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Have I put a distance of one day between thee and the just man? Did I not make the sun to arise upon thee as upon the just? But the soul was silent, having nothing to answer. So we all have a fair shot at choosing and walking out the choice to change in this life. And there is no answer we can give to get over on Elohim for not doing our duty to keep his commandments. Continue, Brother Casa, please. And again there came a voice saying, Just as the judgment of Allah Hayyam, and there is no acceptance of persons with Allah Hayyam. Mm -hmm. So Paul heard and saw this, so he told us the same thing in this gospel. There is no respect of person with Allah Hayyam. So our race or worldly glory or ability to manipulate and gain people won't save us from judgment if we don't actually change because in heaven our sins are known as the man's iniquity weighed on him and the evil stench went forth from him because of the evil spirits that had place in him all Allah is looking for is a merciful soul like himself who does right like him continue brother Casa, please for whoever shall have done mercy on them shall he have mercy. And whoever shall not have pitied, neither shall Allah pity him. Let him therefore be handed over to the angel Tartaruk, who is set over the punishments, and let him place him in outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, and let him be there till the great day of judgment. And after these things I heard the voice of angels and archangels, saying, Thou art just, Lord, and thy judgment is just. And that's what awaits us if we don't get out the pleasure we walk in and idols and evil desires. That angel of wickedness who leads us unto them will curse and threaten us, and the spirits we serve will also not help us before Allah am. Now what we saw was what happens to a scorner who hates and does not uphold the law where they get sent straight to torments with no rest. This is according to the testimonies. Can we read 2nd Edgeworth chapter 7, verse 79 through 83, please, Brother Casa? Sure. 2nd Edgeworth chapter 7, verse 79. If it is one of those who have shown scorn and have not kept the way of the Most High, who have despised his law and hated those who fear Allah Hayyam, such spirits shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, always grieving and sad in seven ways. The first way, because they have scorned the law of the Most High. The second way, because they cannot now make a good repentance so that they may live. The third way, they shall see the reward laid up for those who have trusted the covenants of the Most High. Right. So hating the law and not taking the opportunity to repent and return to it so we can live, believe in the covenant of the Most High will torment us if we don't take the time we have now to do it. The just who showed their faith and appreciation for the sacrifice and grace period by doing the work, on the other hand, will be rewarded with good. And that's what we want to be. We want to be rewarded with good because we actually took the time to learn and to grow in the grace period to get to get it right. Continue, Brother Costa. If you don't mind, we'll jump over to um verse 88, if you don't mind, please. Sure. Verse 88. Now this is the order of those who have kept the ways of the most high. When they shall be separated from their mortal body. During the time that they lived in it, they laboriously served the Most High and withstood danger every hour 
so that they might keep the law of the lawgiver perfectly. Mm -hmm. So they believed Elohim and worked because they believed in the promise that they would receive life if they kept the law. So they did everything they could to keep the commandments Moses gave perfectly, which is sincerely to offer themselves unto Elohim in love. Go ahead and continue, Brother Kasa, please. Verse 90, the first order, because they have shriven with great effort to overcome the evil thought that was formed with them, so that it might not lead them astray from life into death. All right. So that, that you have to overcome the evil thought that's formed with you, because that evil thought is, is trying to enter in. So it's trying to it's trying to be formed where you actually create a habit and where you get into a a, a um cycle of operating in it so that it's formed with you. Right? You don't we don't want that evil spirit to to be connected with us. Right? So that it might not lead them astray from life unto death. We don't want that that evil spirit to lead us astray from life. So they did the work to make no provision for the flesh by letting evil thoughts enter into their hearts or to be with them, to lead them from life and the commandments garnered by humility and long suffering unto death. Not walking in the pride of self-will to do anything against the commandments. The opportunity hasn't changed for us today to do the same thing sincerely. So we have the same opportunity to actually strive to, to walk and overcome the evil. Let's see if we try to talk our way out of punishments to win over Elohim like we do people in the world if it'll work with Elohim. Can we read the Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 16, Brother Casa, please? Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 16. And again I saw, and behold, a soul which was led forward by two angels, weeping and saying, Have pity on me, just Allah I am, Allah I am the judge. For today is seven days since I went out of my body, and I was handed over to these two angels, and they led me through to those places which I had never seen. So let's look at what happens when we don't do right with the grace period. Um, let's look, let's jump over to Second Ezra chapter seven, verse eighty-four through eighty-six, real quick. Verse eighty-four. The fourth way they shall consider the torment laid up for themselves in the last days. The fifth way they shall see how the habitation of the others are guarded by angels in profound quiet. The sixth way, they shall see how some of them will cross over into torments. Mm -hmm. So he is asking for pity after seeing these things. So he's, he's witnessed these things and now he's asking for pity. Let's see if Allah will have mercy in the afterlife after we didn't take advantage of his mercy in this life. Can we jump back over to Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 16, please, cuz. Chapter 16, continuing. And Allah Hayyam, the just judge, saith to him, What hast thou done? For thou never didst mercy. Wherefore thou wast handed over to such angels as have no mercy. And because thou didst not do uprightly, so neither did they act piously with thee in the hour of thy need. Mm -hmm. right. So he renders to every man according to our works. Since the soul didn't keep the law to walk uprightly and show the fruits of mercy like the Father, he was rewarded with angels that treat him just as he operated in the world. So you can see, love your neighbor as yourself, and doing unto others as you will have them do unto you is a sincere request, as he will render unto us whatever measure we give out in the world and wants us to receive good after this life by doing good in this life. It's something to consider in every action and thought. Do I want this done back to me? 
that would help have the right heart in things or be considerate of others. If we confess our faults now and work to change, we can be forgiven when we forsake our evil. Right? And this is why we want to be very quick to repent so that Allah will have mercy upon us. Uh, can we read Proverbs 28 and 13, please, Kasa? Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. All right. All right. So, if we don't take the opportunity to confess, but try to hide our sins, Allah will still make us confess it in our death, along with rewarding us according to what we were truly doing. All right. So, to change in this world, we have to confess and forsake to have mercy. So, we actually have to confess our sin and forsake the works of it. And that will give us mercy to help us to, to gain salvation. Kathy, can we continue in Apocalypse of Paul 16 again, please? Confess therefore thy sins which thou didst commit when placed in the world. And he answered and said, Lord, I did not sin. All right. So we see how he operated in the world. He never took accountability. He was used to manipulating in the world to deceive and lie to get out of things in the world and tried to do it with Elohim. How we treat others is how we treat Elohim. He was dishonest, so he still walked in his dishonesty in the afterlife, trying to talk his way out of things by pleading for pity and saying he didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't work with Allah in this world or in the afterlife. We truly have to take accountability. We can't cover our sins. All right, because if we cover our sins, what are we allowed to enter into us? That's deceit, lying. So we actually, through our works, we actually are showing what spirit that's with us. And it only grieves Allah and makes it worse for us. Continue, Brother Casa. And the Lord, the just Lord, was angered in fury when it said, I did not sin, because it lied. Right. That's right. Continue, Casa. And Allah said, Does thou think? Thou art still in the world? If any one of you is sinning there, conceal and hide his sin from his neighbor. Here, indeed, nothing whatever shall be hid. So now we know the truth. Hiding our sin is possible with men in the world, though it doesn't profit us to get mercy truly. And yet, and still, Allah sees it all and holds us accountable for it when we go before him. So you may be able to do that in the world, but in the heavens, it doesn't work. So it would be good to use this grace period to come out of such tactics if you're operating such manipulation. It will be good to work on coming out of it in this grace period and not continuing in it until your time of death. Because if those spirits are on you, it's hard to stop. You're going to operate in them. You're not going to be able to stop. Everyone's going to see that you're operating in manipulation. It, it can't be hidden because if you're doing it, you're going to continue to do it. You can't just stop it in the blink of an eye. You actually have to work to come out of it because it's, it's a habit. If that spirit becomes with you. Right. Can you continue, Brother Casa, please? 
Here indeed nothing whatever shall be hid. For when the souls come to adore in the sight of the throne, both the good works and the sins of each one are made manifest. And hearing these things, the soul was silent, having no answer. Mm -hmm. So nothing is hid, and we can't talk our way out of the wrongs we've done, especially before Elohim. We actually have to use the grace period we have to do right with steadfastness and learn to keep the law sincerely in faith so we can have an account of good works before we died with Elohim in appreciation for his mercy towards us. Continue, Brother Casa, please. And I heard the Lord Elohim, the just judge, again saying, Come, angel of this soul, and stand in the midst. And the angel of the sinful soul came, having in his hands a manuscript, and said, These, Lord, in my hands are all the sins of this soul from his youth till today, from the tenth year of his birth. And if thou command, Lord, I will also relate his acts from the beginning of his fifteenth year. And the Lord Elohim, the just judge, said, I say to thee, angel, I do not expect of thee an account of him since he began to be fifteen years old. But state his sins for five years before he died and before he came hither. Allah, I am even after all we've done from youth isn't holding that against us. So you can see the spirit of Allah, I am that he doesn't hold our past against us. So if you fall into holding someone's past against them, then you see where it's coming from. It's not of Allah. I am. So we shouldn't hold it against ourselves or let it bother us when others try to hold our past against us because Allah doesn't. And he's the one who can kill us truly and has power to judge. Continue, Brother Casa, please. And again, Allah the just judge said, for by myself I swear, and by my holy angels, and by my virtue, that if he had repented five years before he died, on account of one year's life, oblivion would now be thrown over all the evils which he sinned before, and he would have indulgence and remission of sins. So this is after Christ's sacrifice, mind you, that a track record of good works is still required, because like we said, when looking at Paul's gospel, we shall be judged by the law because faith in Christ only justified for sins that are past before we believed at first. But doing righteousness justifies us from the point forward. And you see it here to be true with Allah, that he requires a track record of good works to justify and bless us with the remission of sins committed in the grace period as we were learning to do right. You even see he gives a grace period to the soul of five years to have repented, believing and started working to get it right so he could do right consistently for at least one year to receive forgiveness. So it's that one year you actually have to, you actually have to do right for one year to receive forgiveness. So you have to take that into accountability for the people that um, have that tendency trying to do everything at the very end or when they when they fall into fear or trying to wait to the end to to complete something that you have to have to been doing right for a year in order to receive forgiveness. So if you don't know when that year is going to come, it'll be smart to do it to start now. Because nobody knows what day they shall perish. Okay. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Now indeed he shall perish. All right. So Allah already knew he didn't bring forth fruits worthy of remission. So if the soul would have taken the time to work on changing and kept the faith for at least a year, keeping the commandments, because he believed and appreciated the grace period, he would have remission of sins and his struggles won't be remembered. But if he can't show a track record of doing right truly for at least a year, 
he shall perish according to Allah. This helps understand we have to actually show ourselves approved unto Allah in this life. There is no repentance to make on the day of our death to save us from not having done righteousness in our life. There is a teaching you can be forgiven on the day you die because of the man that was crucified with Christ. The man on the cross with Christ who has committed the power of judgment was forgiven by Christ himself because of his faith in him and the Lord and judge himself giving him remission and permitting him to be in the paradise with him. That was before he gave his blood and life for us to have this grace period. So Christ didn't die yet. Now, everything that's happening now is after Christ has died and after his blood has been spilt for us. The man on the cross, his, the blood wasn't spilt yet. So Yache was able to give him that remission. All right. So for us in this life today, after Christ already gave his body and blood for us, we owe a debt. Life for life. And are required to show ourselves living a life unto Allah, keeping his commandments and payment for the life sacrificed for us for at least a year before we die. If not, we won't have remission of our sins according to what Paul saw in the gospel he preached because only the doers of the law after they believe will be justified. Let's see if this soul did right for a year before he died so he can have remission of sins and be delivered from the unmerciful and unjust angels. Can we continue, Brother Casa, please? And the angel of the sinful soul answered and said, Lord, command the angel to exhibit those souls. All right. So we were supposed to love our neighbor of holding the law in our interactions with others, not being men pleasers or respect of a person trying to gain others or to get their glory, but just loving them uprightly for Allah sake. Now the souls who died before us and we didn't do right by them according to the law, they are presented to us when we die to give account of how we wronged them according to the law. This is to understand having respect the person to sin for others' sake or sin against others for the sake of our desires is not worth it, as it's just going to be a reproach and justification to condemn us when we are judged. Can we continue in chapter 17, Brother Costa, please? Sure, chapter 17. And in that same hour, the souls were exhibited in the mist, and the soul of the sinner knew them. And the Lord said to the soul of the sinner, I say to thee, soul, confess thy work which thou wroughtest in these souls whom thou seest when they were in the world. And he answered and said, Lord, it is not yet a full year since I slew this one and poured his blood upon the ground. All right. So you see what Allah said, he shall perish. He hadn't done right according to the law sincerely for a year like Allah required. So he said it wasn't even a year. He had just killed someone. Go ahead, Kasim. And with another, a woman, I committed fornication. Not this alone, but I also greatly harmed her in taking away her goods. All right. So now he's finally being honest in confession after not taking advantage of the opportunity in his life to do it and forsake his works. But now he has to confess his works and what he's done in that last year. Go ahead, Brother Kassel. And the Lord Allah, the just judge, said, Either thou didst not know that he who does violence to another... If he dies first, who sustains the violence is kept in this place until the doer of hurt dies, and then both stand in the presence of the judge, and now each receives according to his deed. Right. So even fornication is considered violence against a person. So understand it's not a light thing to desire it, to commit adultery with our eyes looking lustfully at people, much less to actually act on it and fulfill the desire. We got to overcome all the works of evil and spiritual fornication with these idols or else will be judged, like Paul said, by the law or perish without law. Continue, Brother Casa, please. 
And I heard a voice of one saying, Let their soul be delivered to the hands of Tartarus, and led down into hell. He shall lead him into the lower prison, and he shall be put in torments, and left there till the great day of judgment. And again I heard a thousand thousand angels saying hymns to the Lord, and crying, Thou art just, O Lord, and just are thy judgments. For well, this is the reward for not doing right, even after Christ made the sacrifice, because doers who aren't forgetful hearers, nor unthankful for the spirit of grace will be justified by their good works in faith and love in the day of the Lord at the end. So understand, though Elohim has mercy and has given us grace, he knows when we won't truly change. And we give the decree to end our opportunity of repentance. And the demons will take advantage of the opportunity to destroy us in their hatred towards mankind. So taking our life lightly or thinking grace will cover our sins in the judgment without a track record of good works, at least for a year, is not a wise thought as you've seen what truly happens in judgment thus far. And that year is the less time that you can have. So if you are doing right, you have to continue in that until your death, or else you're falling short of the grace of Allah. I am. So we have to be mindful of what's against us and how those things that are against us work against us so that we can abstain from them. Can we jump over to Sirach 5 and 5 and 6, please, Brother Cousin? Sure. Sirach chapter 5, verse 5. Concerning propitiation, be not without fear to add sin unto sin, and say not, his mercy is great, he will be pacified for the multitude of my sins. For mercy and wrath come from him, and his indignation resteth upon sinners. All right, so taking one side of Alahayim and using it when it's convenient for you will make you fall into indignation. You will fall into Alahayim's indignation because you have to understand that Alahayim has great mercy, but at the same time, he has great wrath. So if you don't do right, you're going to receive the wrath. If you do right, you're going to receive the mercy. Like Christ's sacrifice can't save us if we're continuing adding sin unto sin. Though we offer oblations with our lips in praise and worship, as he isn't the minister of sin, so he's not going to justify you. Can we jump over to Sirach 7, 8, please, and 9? Yes, Sirach chapter 7, verse 8. Bind not one sin upon another, for in one thou shalt not be unpunished. Say not, Allah will look upon the multitude of my oblations, and when I offer unto the Most High Allah, he will accept it. All right. So when you fall into a sin, or you fall, don't continue sinning. And justifying it because you've already fallen. All right. For no one thou shalt not be unpunished. So you're going to be punished for the sin you committed and all the other ones that you commit with it. All right. So you can understand. All right. Say not Allah will look upon the multitude of my ablations. Say not Allah is going to look upon all the praise and 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 alms I've done. And when I offer to the Most High Allah, He will accept it. Right? He's not going to accept it because you're not actually doing what He's asking you to do. You're not being obedient. We saw in the death for those souls, these things aren't true. Only work in righteousness. We saw the, the soul of the impious and the, and the righteous. Only work in righteousness by our faith in Christ would justify us and make our offerings and propitiation of good works acceptable with Allahim. 
We can't come before him in the judgment empty-handed without good works. And that's what he's looking for. That's why he asks, where are the fruits that thou, that thou bringest forth? Like we have to come with something in our hands. And for us, our works are what we come forth with that we did in this life. Uh, can we go, can we read um, Surat 35, verse 1 through 4, please, Captain? Sure. He that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. He that requiteth a good turn offereth fine flour, and he that giveth alms sacrificeth praise. To depart from wickedness is a thing pleasing to the Lord, and to forsake unrighteousness is a propitiation. Thou shalt not appear empty before the Lord. Now look at that. It says, he that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. So just by keeping the commandments, Allah Hayyam is pleased with that. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. So if you actually stop and consider the law in, in, your, time, in your time that you're being tempted, you're bringing forth a peace offering. He that requiteth a good turn offers fine flour. So if somebody does something well for you and you go and do something well back, that's another thing that Allah is pleased with because it's selfless. He that giveth alms sacrifices praise. To depart from wickedness is a thing pleasing to the Lord. To depart from, from the spirit of wickedness that projects or, or forecasts grievous things, it's actually a thing pleasing to the Lord that you actually depart from it. And to forsake unrighteousness is a propitiation. So to do no evil, Allah is pleased with that. You do those things and your hands are going to be, are not going to be empty before Allah He is good and patient in his pity and lets us do as we want in this life. We do have that liberty. Also because he knows there are punishments for our bad works. It gives us time to consider that and change. But if we don't change, we're going to suffer. We're going to go through it with him. He's going to judge us. Can we read the Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 32, please, Cosmo, please? Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 32. I indeed, when I heard this, wept and groaned over the human race. The angel answered and said unto me, Why dost thou weep? Art thou more pitiful than Allah Hayyam? For though Allah Hayyam is good, he knows also that there are punishments and he patiently bears with the human race, dismissing each one to work his own will in the time in which he dwells on the earth. All right. So Allah allows us to operate in our own will on the time we dwell upon the earth. So we each get to do what we want because of his patience. Yet there are punishments if we let the desires we have and desires of this world keep us from taking advantage of the opportunity of grace in this life to learn and keep Allah in ways and joy. We have to be mindful. Can we read uh, chapter 40 of Apocalypse of Paul, please, Constant? Yes, Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 40. And after that I saw men and women clothed with rags, full of pitch and fiery sulfur, and dragons were coiled about their necks and shoulders and feet, and angels having fiery horns restrained them and smote them and closed their nostrils, saying to them, Why did ye not know the time in which it was right to repent and serve Allah Hayyam, and did not do it? And I asked, Sir, who are these? And he said to me, These are they who seem to give up the world for Allah Hayyam, 
putting on our garb. But the impediments of the world made them wretched, not maintaining agape, which is charity. And they did not pity widows and orphans. They did not receive the stranger and the pilgrim, nor did they offer the oblations. And they did not pity their neighbor. Moreover, their prayer did not even on one day ascend pure to the Lord Allah Hayyam, but many impediments of the world detained them, and they were not able to do right in the sight of Allah Hayyam, and the angels enclosed them in the place of punishments. So these are the punishments if we don't choose to work and overcome. Yet it's not because Allah Hayyam isn't pitiful. So you definitely can't, you can't put that upon Allah Hayyam, that Allah Hayyam isn't showing mercy, or Allah Hayyam isn't pitiful. It's us that are actually taking it for granted, or taking Allah Hayyam for granted. Uh, continue, Brother Kassim. Are uh, there more pitiful than the Lord Allah Hayyam, who is blessed forever, who established judgment? and sent forth every man to choose good and evil in his own will and do what pleases him? All right. So it really boils down to simply knowing we have choice and truly are doing what pleases us in every decision. That's the reality. The reality is that we are making our own choices and we're cleaving unto the spirits that please us. And that's why we get judged. Can we read uh, the Gad the Seer chapter eight verse seven, please, Kasi? So we can so we can learn more about that free choice. Gad yeah, the Seer chapter eight, verse seven. And he gave each one free choice. If one wants to do good, he will be helped, and if one wants to do evil, a path will be opened for him. All right. So if we choose and are pleased to please Allah Hayyam through obedience, there would be a good spirit to help us do good. On the dichotomy, an evil spirit will come to aid us in lawlessness or self-will or self-pleasing if we truly desire our own will. So we have to consider it. Don't take this life or his grace for granted either just because he hasn't touched us with death for our own dealings. If we wait until that time, we won't have a chance to repent. All right, so we have to be mindful and, be, and consider these things in every action, in every moment, in every decision, so that we can actually make the right decision and not be hasty in our in our in our works. Uh, hasty in our works of hatred to cause us to go astray from Allah Hayyam. We have to be mindful of these things and slow to, to think, slow to process so that we can actually consider it. Consider the works that we're doing and who we're doing it unto. Can we read on Sirach chapter 5 verse 2 and 4 please, Kathy? Yes, Sirach chapter 5, verse 2. Follow not thine own mind and thy strength to walk in the ways of thy heart. Verse 4. Say not, I have sinned, and what harm hath happened unto me? For the Lord is long-suffering. He will in no wise let thee go. So every evil we do, though no harm may come upon us at that moment, is recorded with Allah Hayyam. And if we don't bring forth a track record of repentance and doing good, he will in no wise let us go from what we've done, thinking we were given grace to continue in evil because no harm happened when we did the wrong. All right? So don't get caught in that misconception that I didn't get in trouble, so I didn't do wrong. Like, if it's wrong, it's wrong, according to Allah Hayyam. And you have to examine that according to Allah Hayyam. And not according to how you feel. Because right? 
jealousy works in feelings or envy. Is it envy? Envy works in feelings. Yes, it's injury. All right. All right. So you definitely want to be mindful because you can feel you can feel that you're right according to envy, which operates in the feelings and be wrong. Okay. So you got to be very mindful of your feelings or going according to your feelings because it will, it will lead you astray. All right. So what is, what is wise for us to do? Cleaving unto Allah, cleaving unto Allah, commandments, cleaving unto the fruits of the spirit and examining and judging all things based off of those things for ourselves when it comes to ourselves that's how we examine ourselves that's how we um that's the what's the word um so that's our guideline right the law and the fruits of the spirit is our guideline for examining ourselves and examining our modes of action Right now, the wisdom scriptures also give us understanding of how to go about things, um, in 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 the law and the fruits of the spirit. So it's still our guideline. Okay, um, brother Costa, can we read Sirach five and seven, please? Yeah. There was something in verse four, if I may speak. Go ahead, bro. I notice the person says, what harm hath happened unto me? Like I did wrong and nothing happened to me. And I remember we talked about in the last lesson about the man pleaser as this, their own perception of Allah Hayyam, or their own perception of what's right. Similar to Ezekiel 18, when they were saying the way of the Lord is not equal. Like the man pleaser is... When someone does wrong, they're quick to judge. Like you need to be punished right then and there. And that it looks like that perspective is applied to Allah Hayyam where I sinned and nothing happened to me. So like I ain't doing wrong, but not understanding his grace to take it like, okay, ain't nothing happened to me then. And I'm good. I'm not really doing anything wrong. It's not that bad. Not really understanding that it's just his long suffering that he's actually dealing in righteousness. as opposed to the righteousness, what would be my own perception of it, that I should have been judged right then and there. And if not, if I'm not judged right then and there, then I didn't do anything wrong or I'm good. What, um, in the, um, Testament of the 12 Patriarchs, what spirit is it that wants you to be? Hatred. All right. So if you're not operating in hatred like what they're used to, then they don't they don't perceive it. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's definitely a clear distinction. If you want somebody to be punished or to get uh uh the capital punishment for something that they may have done and you want it to come quickly, or you even desire for them to get the capital punishment. And you know what spirit is behind it. Yeah. Because interesting, hatred, hatred worketh to men's death, right? Because if you sin vainly, it wouldn't suffer you to live. But the law, but love worketh with the law of Allah Hayyam through long suffering. And seeing Allah Hayyam operates in his own ways, in that he's long suffering too, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he gives you the opportunity to see your wrongs and confess it yourself. But if you don't, he's gonna touch you because he in no way is gonna let you go. Right. Sirach chapter five verse seven: Make no tarrying to turn to the Lord, and put not off from day to day. For suddenly shall the wrath of the Lord come forth. And in thy security, thou shalt be destroyed and perish in the day of vengeance. All right. So that's touching just like what Uncasifo said. 
he said, putting that off from day to day because you're not getting touched, that you feel like you got time or you're not doing wrong. For suddenly shall the wrath of the Lord come forth. And then thy security, thy security was, is I'm not doing wrong because I'm not getting a punishment right away. So in thy security, thou shalt be destroyed and perish in the day of vengeance. Right? Because you're going to be taking out the grace for granted or his long suffering for granted. So putting off changing for our desire's sake will one day when Allah sees we truly aren't valuing the opportunity and grace we've been given, the decree will be given to bring about some sudden or random event the demons bring about to destroy us out of this world because the sentence went forth from Allah to end our time of repentance because we weren't going to change. So that's the falling away in this life, thinking we had grace to continue in our ways but when our day of vengeance for our works comes upon us, we perish out of this world by some demonic attack masked as a random accident that was for our sins and taking his mercy for granted because of our desires we didn't want to let go or didn't believe though we were corrected or what we don't want to see because the pleasure we received from the acts and hope on the Lord so we could come out of them fearing to do the work to overcome, seeking a miracle so we don't have to actually put in the work to change or believe in the lie that we didn't need to overcome them because of grace and faith. And this is what we have in the law in It says in the law of Leviticus 19 and 17, it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Because it's an act of hatred not to correct your brother. Because you're allowing them to continue and you're not helping them in their grace period. You're allowing them to continue in sin, though you may see it and they may not, and you're not saying anything. And that's actually hatred. It said, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him, because that's love. Correcting them or chastening them, because you see something that they're doing that isn't right and they need help to see it, is love. But if I see something and I see you doing something and I blind my eyes to it and allow you to continue working and doing it, then I'm showing you that I hate you. Because I would rather you go and continue in the evil spirit so that Allah can judge you. That's why at the next verse it says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Ahiah. Because it's the, it's the avenging and the grudge that causes you not to say anything to them. Because you may be upset about what they've done. You may be upset at how they may have they may have treated you or trespassed against you. And because of how you feel about what they've done, you don't correct them, taking things into your own vengeance. Now, Remember the sinner was suffering knowing he despised the law. It's because hatred was at work in him. Our desires are the things we covet after that are not according to Allah ways all stem from hatred in our hearts towards Allah 
and his law and the spirit of lion that helps lead us to go after our, our own desires. Can we start in the um the Testament of God, chapter five, verse one, please, Kasa? Sure. The Testament of God, chapter five, verse one. Hatred, therefore, is evil, for it constantly mateth with lying, speaking against the truth, and teacheth slander. It's interesting. Hatred. It says it constantly made us with lying because walking in hatred, you're actually um you're actually walking in the spirit that the devil walks in. So it makes with lying. Hatred therefore is evil. I want to touch on this. Hatred therefore is evil, for it constantly made us with lying. Hatred, hatred. It constantly made it for lying because lying is the son of the devil. So they actually start working together. And they speak against the truth because Yah chased the truth. So they have to stand against him. So you're either going to be operating in love and truth, or you're going to be operating in lies and hatred. because they're one against one another. Now, it makes a clear distinction when you're looking at things in regards to the world and Alahayim, because the ways of the world is in hatred and lying, whereas the ways of Alahayim is in truth and love. They actually are opposites of one another. So you can actually see that the clear distinction of actually walking in love with Alahayim is by actually learning actually what love is to Alahayim. And also, you can see the clear distinctions of walking in hatred because you can learn according to the ways of Alahayim what it is and what it means and what are the acts to walk in hatred. So it actually starts making a very clear distinction And you actually see Alahayim is love. The Father is love. Yache is the truth. They come together just as Satan and hatred and lying come together, which is the son of the devil. So you actually see how it actually works spiritually. Now, when dealing with hatred and lying, they speak against the truth and they also teach slander that means that they welcome evil speaking because they delight in it and they also delight to evil speak they speak ill things about others and this is where you actually have where wickedness actually ties to that because wickedness forecasteth grievous things so it actually starts tying into it where it's not just slander Now you start to go into other things when you start tying other spirits with it, where wickedness is going to forecast a slander or forecast something grievous that they may not even know. So you see how that, that root of hatred, how it just takes you further and further into darkness. Whereas that root of love takes you further and further into love. It's the root of things that actually define what direction we're going. And, and in talking about a grace period, this grace period, we're supposed to be walking towards that love, doing things that Allah says is right and good and pleasing that's actually going to get us to Allah, which is love, so that we can actually fulfill our grace period and actually get the baptism and get the seal of the Holy Spirit so that we're sealed in our baptism to walk forward in righteousness with help from, with help from Allah. So you can actually, you get to see the whole full dichotomy and actually start, start being able to clearly divide things 
based off of what Alahaim is showing, things are. Because we can't walk according to what we think things are or how things are to us. It has to be according to how Alahaim views it and how Alahaim says it operates and what it does. And that right there would give us the, the understanding to be able to discern good and evil. And that would allow us to then make the choice to keep our heart away from it or to give into it. And based off of what we give ourselves into, it's the, it's the, the path that we're going, whether it's going to love or whether it's going to hatred. So it, it really does help us to really understand what we're doing in our grace period, to actually look back and analyze and reflect and examine ourselves as to what direction are we going. And it, it, it really should help us and notice in Sirach chapter 4, when it talks about getting the Holy Spirit and how she operates, it talks about, in no wise speak against the truth, be abashed for the error of thine ignorance. And then seeing the simplicity of Allah being love and Yache being truth, in order to get to the Holy Spirit, she was exhorting us not to speak against them, essentially. And if we find out something we're doing or something we're saying or something we're thinking, isn't according to the truth to be ashamed of it and confess the sin and forsake it, you know, so that we can actually continue walking towards love and truth in Allah. And now getting that clear dichotomy you just explained, knowing that whenever our feelings, our speech or our view or what we're doing is actually against the truth, we know hatred and lying is at work slander and Allah to get us to go a different direction. That's correct. Because what else does it do, Kasim? And kindleth wrath. Right. So now it's kindling wrath because now it's heading you in another direction. You're going towards hatred. Like easily being given the passions comes from hatred and heart, or at least the hatred and heart. Not love, which is a long suffering spirit, nor is she easily provoked to get in her feelings, nor thinks evil to get her in her feelings. Yeah. Right? So she doesn't operate in wickedness. That's why we're supposed to be still and not sin and sit down and reason out to get out of our feelings whenever we find ourselves in them. Knowing it's given place to the devil, leading us to hatred towards Allah if we act or speak in our frustrations or feelings. And as we keep going, we're going to continue going on the path toward hatred. What's next, Kasim? And stirreth up war and violence and all covetousness. Right. We're continually going down this path. Like this is where it's leading you. If 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 this is the works that you're working on in your grace period, you're eventually going to get to these other places. And this is where we're seeing this great split in the world right now. Because some people are on their path to hatred and some people are on their path to love. And you see their stages. You're going to go from doing this, then you're going to do this next thing, then you're going to start doing these next things. You get to see where the world is. And the world is very close. To, many of them are at hatred. If not, the other majority are very, very close to it. Because there is war, violence, covetousness, wrath. And if we keep on going, we're going to get into some other stuff because it's further, it's further you can go. All right. 
So all covetousness, whatever it may be, comes from hatred at work and lying to darken our mind to give over to the desire. And what else does it do, Casa? What's next? It filleth the heart with evils and devilish poison. Right. So now the heart is completely evil. It's completely filled. And, and devilish poison. Now you're doing witchcraft and whatever else comes with being on that level, being that close to Satan. Because it's two sides. You have one side, once you get yourself over and you get to the place of hatred, you're close to whatever it is that is that spirit. So then you become a prophet of that one. Or you become very spiritual. You start getting gifts from that one because you're so close to them. And on the other side, once you get to the place where you are at where love is, you're close to Allah I am. And that's where you start getting prophets. You start getting um, people who have spiritual gifts because that is, they're, they're that close. So you get to see the two dichotomies and how they operate. And you can see the ways of the world and you can see the ways of Allah I am. And it gets very, very clear. So we give in to poisons of lust. They give in, they're, they're at the place where they're giving in to that because that's in their grace period, that's where they're that's where they headed. Whereas Allah I am willing for us, our grace period, we're heading towards love. So we give in to the poisons of lust, and this is where we don't want to give into it. We want to turn. We, want, we don't want to go that direction, right? And it leads us to love anything and anyone above Allah Hayyam, that's the wrong way to go. Because that leads us to being covetous. For many, that love would be money. So for many people, when they're going in this direction, the love of money becomes that problem. It becomes the thing that gets them to that point of hatred. For many, that love would be money. But in either case, love for anything or anyone above the Allah Hayyam leads to idolatry because the command is to love them with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, and all your strength. So if you're given that that love, and that love is above that love that you have for Allah, Hayyam, you're going a different direction. That's why it says, "Can you read the? Can you, Kasa, Can you read uh, the Testament of Judah, chapter eighteen, verse one, please?" Testament of Judah, chapter eighteen, verse one. My children. The love of money leadeth to idolatry. Right. So that love that you have for that affinity leadeth you to idolatry. It leads you to Satan because it's leading you to hatred. So you can actually understand this is why we can't love anything greater than Allah I am. And we're not even supposed to love money. You're just supposed to utilize it. Because it says the love of money leads to idolatry. That means that we're not supposed to love money at all. Now, in regards to anything else, Allah Yahweh said, if you love thy mother, you love thy brother more than me, then you're not worthy of me. So you can love them, but you just can't love them more than Allah Hayyam. To be a respecter of persons, because that's what it would cause you to do.
it will cause you to be a respected person where you're not willing to correct them or you're not willing to do what's right according to Allah for respecting them or respecting how they would want something to be. Or whatever the case. This is why we have to love Allah with all our heart, all our soul, all our might, and all our strength. Because that's what's going to actually lead us to love. Right. So, love is anything we covered after over Allah which will make us idolaters. So, we love anything over Allah that leads us to idolatry. And the love of money in itself will lead you to idolatry. Pastor, can we jump over to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, so we can understand that by walking in that direction, just to confirm it, by walking in that in that direction towards um towards hatred and the things that one would do walking in that direction would not get us into the kingdom. Ephesians 5 and 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of Allah. Okay. So is that simple? You can't put anything above them in our affinity in this life, or it makes us an idolater. It makes us an idolater after whatever we love more than them. So whatever we love more than them becomes our idol. For example, Eli the priest, who loved his sons more than Allah, to his and their detriment, he didn't want to correct them. He actually did what you spoke about earlier about accountability. He would say something to them, but he wouldn't hold them accountable. So it was just in words to actually right. require action. So he didn't correct them. He just let them, he he told them what was right and then left it unto them to do what they wanted yeah. instead of actually helping them and putting them in an environment where they would have to change for their better like Allah puts us in environments where we have to change. Like he was going to put the man and, and his family in servitude so that they would have to make the necessary changes to be able to, to exact or to bring forth good fruit or to bring, you know, the depth that was old. Whereas Eli just said it and let them continue in their iniquity because of his respect, the persons toward them, which is not actually holding them accountable. So, like, we actually have to, especially as being parents to our children, you definitely have to, if they, if you see something going on, you definitely have to bring it forth, which Eli did. But you also have to actually correct them by putting them in an environment that is going to be suitable for their change or have to or they're going to have to to work on that thing that needs to be changed. Like I'm going to put you in a, in a place where it's going to help you. Like, and that's how you actually help them. Like, you can't just lead them to themselves. Do you have anything, Casa Fugo? No. Okay. Praise Allah. Uh, first, Timothy 6 and 10, so that we can just kind of we want to make sure that we understand that first timothy 6 and 10 for the love of money is the root of all evil 
which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now look at that. It says, which some have coveted after. Now remember, when it talked about hatred, it said, hatred constantly made up of lying, speaking against the truth, and teacheth slander, kindleth wrath, and stir up war and violence and all covetousness. You see, they were actually on that path. That's the path that they were traveling. So for the love of money is the root of all, all evil, which some, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. Because that covetousness actually was leading them to hatred and leading them to the devil. And they were willing to and pierce themselves through with many sorrows because they were willing to break many commandments just to get it. Right. The law is a piercing sword for word. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to solidify that. Um, now we want to work on some things taking us further into love so let's jump over to the testament of God chapter 6 verse 3 if testament you don't mind Catherine, please I know testament of God chapter 6 verse 3 love ye therefore one another from the heart and if a man sin against thee Cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to him, and in thy soul hold not guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. Verse 6. And though he deny it, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving him. For he who denieth may repent, so as not again to wrong thee. Yea, he may also honor thee and fear, and be at peace with thee. And if he be shameless and persist in his wrongdoing, even so forgive him from the heart and leave to Allah Hayyam the avenging. Now look at that. Thank you, cousin. Now look at that. It starts off by saying, love ye. So this is going to take us in the direction of love. And this is what the scriptures do over and over. It actually tells us how to go a direction. And this is what we're learning in our in our in our journey. This is what we're learning in our grace period is how to go in the direction that we want to go. That should be the question for you to be seeking in your journey. Love ye therefore one another from the heart. Like love one another from the heart. And if somebody do wrong against you, or if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hate. So don't take it to heart. Don't get angry at them as if they're doing something to you and they hate you. Cast forth the poison of hate and speak peaceably to them. Speak words to get an understanding. And in thy soul, hold not guile. So don't just be talking to them to figure out something so that you can use it against them. Or just taking what they did and holding it so you can use it later because that would be guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. If he confess and say, you know what, I was wrong. And, and repent for it, forgive them. Don't still hold it. And though he deny it, and even if he says that he ain't do it, or she says she didn't do it, okay, and yet have a sense of shame when reproved, but they, they don't like to be reproved. They don't like to be corrected. Some people have a shame in being corrected they, because of their, their uh, 
high, a heightened sense of self. That's a struggle. They still have to come out of that. So even if they have a sense of shame when reproved, give over reproving them. Don't reprove them again. Right? Because for he who denieth may repent as not to again to wrong thee. So don't bring it up. Just say it. Okay, if they don't agree to it, just leave it alone. Because they may have a, a sense of shame where they can't humble themselves to say, I was wrong and you're right. But they may do it within themselves and, and not do it again. Yea, he may also honor thee and fear and be at peace with thee. And if he be shameless and persistent in his wrongdoings, even so forgive him from the heart. So that one person, they may honor you after that, after you corrected them, though they may not say that, that what they did was wrong, they may have a, a new respect for you. So they may honor you and fear and be at peace with you. But, if that person keep doing it and they didn't hear you or didn't take heed to your words, and if he be shameless and persistent in his wrongdoing, even so, forgive him from the heart. Just forgive him. And leave to Allah the avenging. Let Allah deal with them. Now, if it's a person that's not of the church, after the first and second admonition, reject. Lead to Allah and their vengeance, but don't continue being around them for them to, to do wrong unto you. If it's a person of the church, you go get your witnesses. And if they persist after the witnesses, you bring it into the church. So there are protocols in place to actually be able to walk in love and not give off to your feelings or to go in a in a in a direction that's unseemly. Now what we're going we we have some we're gonna I am definitely gonna make sure that we understand go in a different direction. Um can we read uh Testament of God chapter four verse one? Please, Brother Compton. Testament of God, chapter 4, verse 1. Beware, therefore, my children of hatred, for it worketh lawlessness even against the Lord himself. For it will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the loving of one's neighbor, and it sinneth against Allah. Right. So these are clear distinctions when one is in the spirit of hatred. Okay. For a work of lawlessness, even against the Lord Himself. Right? Because hatred and love, they don't go together. Right? And it and it can't keep any of the commandments. It doesn't want to keep the commandments. For it will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the loving of one's neighbor. So when it comes to to forgiving or anything in that nature, you're going to have a hard time. Anyone that struggles with hatred is going to have a hard time with forgiveness or letting things go. And it's sin if against Allah because... It's opposite. It's, it's the spirit of his adversary. There's no way you're going to please Allah operating in hatred. And anyone that goes is heading in that direction. Now, let's see how hatred works so that we can continue understanding how hatred acts as a spirit so that we can actually see if if hatred 
has any place in us at any time so that we can actually stand against it, so that we can actually be aware of it according to how Allah dictates how hatred operates and not according to anyone's own interpretation of how hatred operates and what it is. Uh, can we read um, Testament of God 5 and 1, please, Casa? Continue on it. Testament of God 5 and 1. And it maketh small things to be great, and causeth the light to be darkness, and calleth the sweet bitter. Right. So it maketh small things to be great. So it can be a small little issue, and it blows it out of proportion. All right. And that's going to happen in people that operate in hatred. It's going to be something small, like you, you don't fold my shirts right, but it's going to become a big, great thing. And it's going to become a real big problem because that person is going to make it a problem because they're looking for something to be angry about. And causes the light to be darkness. So one moment, they may be all good, and the relationship may be fine. And the next moment, it completely switches. Causes the light to be darkness. And causes the bitter sweet. So nothing's going to make sense. It's going to be very hard to appease that person. Remember, hatred speaks against the truth. So it turns the truth of having mercy and compassion and looking at everything according to the law of Allah to be petty, thinking its way is better than the law and seeing things the wrong way by looking at things in hatred. And according to its own perspective and peculiar vision in the darkness of lies instead of the truth of Allah So that we won't love ourselves in truth to hold ourselves accountable to the law or have mercy on ourselves to be positive and encouraged in the process of learning to keep the law. And then when it comes to others, we would also lack mercy for them and truth by not keeping the law in regard to one's neighbor or holding them accountable to the law. Then if they stumble, the hatred won't let them live it down. For hatred will store up reproaches to use against them, while at the same time using the reproaches of others and your own sense to keep the person in darkness, guilt tripping ourselves when we fall to not have confidence to come out of it ourselves or compassion for the downfalls of our neighbors. And we continue in, um, in Gad um, 4 and 3, Casa, please. Sure. Testament of Gad chapter 4, verse 3. But if a brother stumble, it delighteth immediately to proclaim it to all men, and is urgent that he should be judged for it and be punished and be put to death. All right. So we seen just like the old man, that the spirit of hatred had entered into his heart. That was the direction that he was going in his grace period. For his son was stumbling and he delighted immediately to proclaim it to the king, to King Solomon. And it's urgent that he should be judged for it and punished and be put to death. The exact same thing. The same spirit. So this is why we have to understand how Allah says these spirits operate so that we can understand and know when someone else is operating that way or when we're falling short of the of the grace of Allah. Um, so that's the work of hatred, not allowing anyone to grow from their shortcomings by guilt tripping holding grudges, and judging without mercy. Love strengthens us to live in the law by faith so we can have life, but hatred tears us down 
So we can't come out of or believe we can come out of our own weaknesses. I would add, nature doesn't let us hold ourselves accountable to come out of it either. Oh, you continue, Carson. Okay. Verse five. For as love would quicken even the dead and would call back them that are condemned to die, so hatred would slay the living, and those that had sinned venially, it would not suffer to live. For the spirit of hatred worketh together with Satan through hastiness of spirit in all things to men's death. But the spirit of love worketh together with the law of Allah and long suffering unto the salvation of men. All right. So you see where we're going, All right? As love would quicken even the dead, love can bring people back to life. And would call back them that are condemned to die. So hatred would slay the living. Hatred is going to kill people that are living. And those that have sinned venially, it would not suffer to live. So it won't capital it won't capital punishment. So the spirit of hatred worketh together with saying right. through hastiness of spirit, and that's what it uses. So when you see yourself or a, another getting hasty in spirit or making quick decisions. You know what, what spirit that is. It's the same hatred. And in all things to men's death, it holds grudges. It won't let no one live it down. It won't let nobody come to repentance or or accept apologies or even sometimes even get to sometimes even get to the place to apologize because it'll hold it, hatred to hold it and not speak it so that there is no solution. But the spirit of love works together with the law of Allah and long suffering unto the salvation of men. Love saves. Love works with the law and law suffering because Allah is love. So love is the only way to be in partnership with his law. Can we read uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, please? Sure. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of Allah. And everyone that loveth is born of Allah and knoweth Allah. He that loveth not knoweth not Allah. For Allah is love. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are all tested in this life to see if we would choose love and the law to be with Allah or hatred in our own law or the devil's law to be against Allah to side with the devil. That's what we're choosing. And the, and the direction we're going is based off of our works. The works that were, or the spirits and, and works that we're bringing forth determines what direction we're heading into. So we actually have to change our works and change the direction we're going. 
if we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, let's touch on forgiveness. Um, can we read Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, please? Matthew 18 and 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Yache saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So this life is to show mercy and heart as Allah does, walking humbly, keeping this law. All right, so we're definitely supposed to this going in the, the direction of love and forgiveness. Like if your brother sin against you, you forgive him. Now, <clears throat> if your brother sin against you and repent, definitely forgive him. If your brother sin against you and don't repent, you still got to forgive him. Though you, in certain cases, we you will have to go according to, as we spoke of about in Matthews, or, but this is your brother, so it will definitely be according to Matthews, all right? So you, you have to get witnesses, and then after that, if he doesn't repent, you have to go to the church. Because we all have to be held accountable. But if he does something else after that, you got to forgive him again because there's something different. Now, let's learn some things to continue walking in that direction towards love. Uh, what's Micah chapter 6, verse 8, please, Casa? Micah 6 and 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth a higher require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy Allah? Right. So he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And these are the things that Allah requires of us if we're walking towards love, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with Allah. Right. So those things are leading us into direction towards love. Let's continue learning some other things, Casa. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 36 through 38, please. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together. And running over, shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Mm -hmm. right. He is simply looking to see who is going to have love by keeping his law and being merciful as he is merciful. So you literally, you literally have to walk the same direction, the same path. All right. Now let's talk about the judgment after the grace of this life. Um, Christ is the same man that gave his life for us to have the grace to learn and attain unto righteousness without being judged to die in the learning process, which is which we're graceful for. It's the same Lord who is ordained to sit in the judgment seat and judge us all if we took his sacrifice and the Father's grace for granted. Can we read Hebrews 13 and 8, please, Cousin? Hebrews 13 and 8. Yache Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Right, so he's not changing. This is how he is, and this is who you have to know him to be. Can we read John chapter 5, verse 22, please? John 5 and 22. 
For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. All right, so this is who we're going to be judged by. And it's gracious that we're going to be judged by him because he came and actually lived as we lived to understand our our trials and tribulations right, and our temptations. So he he's the best person suited to judge us because he can understand us truly, having experienced it. Can we uh, continue in John 5 and 23, please? That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Can we jump over to five, uh, John 5 and 30, please? The first 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. All right. So we see, remember when we were talking about how to operate in love? He's not selfish. He's selfless. He said, I can of my, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just. Right, so he's not doing anything according to his own will. He's doing everything according to his father's. He's doing something for someone else. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the father which hath sent me. And this is how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be selfless. That we're not seeking our own will, but we're seeking Allah Hayyam's will. And we're looking to help others. So that that love can be perfected in us. So, Yache is in the judgment seat when we're judged. Right? And we're going to receive based off our works. Can we... um? Can we read 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, please, Kasa? 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. All right, so this is what we're going to be judged by. He also doesn't have respect to persons similar to the Father, and the judging according to the law not about our appearance or what we try to say to win them over, but truly weighing our actions. Um, can we read Isaiah chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, please, Kasim? Isaiah 11, verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of Ahia, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So his words will slay the unrighteous. So whomever isn't doing right won't live, as he won't know any work of iniquity. Can we read uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, please? 1 Samuel 2 and 3. Talk no more exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For Ahaya is an Allah of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. All right. So by Elohim, he's going to weigh our actions. So it doesn't matter what we say. He's going to actually see our actions and our works, and that's what we're going to be judged by. All right. So us having that fear of understanding that, what will we do? Could we read Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eleven and nine, please? Second Corinthians five and eleven. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Verse nine. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. All right. 
So we'll be accepted of him if we labor now and do the work during the grace period, taking advantage of the opportunity to get it right and work righteousness steadfastly unto the end so that we may be counted as friends by doing justly by the commands and walking in the love outlined in the law to show we know his father too. Now, how how do we become friends of Allah And if we walk in what is outlined in the law, how do we become friends of Allah Let's read John 15 and 14, please. Sure. John 15 and 14. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. All right. So his friends are shown by actions and obedience. So this is how we actually become the friends of Allah Hayyam. Right? Because if we don't actually show our actions, then we fall into another area. Um, can we read Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, please? Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Okay. So we see that it was all words. It wasn't by the actions. It wasn't by their works. They said they cast out devils, but you can you can truly see that Allah never knew them. Now look at this. Now this is where it starts to get very interesting. It's because. It says, not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. It never said that they knew him. They were just saying, Lord, Lord, like they were pleading because their time of judgment had came. So it's the same spirit that of the man that, that went to go and get it. Did we talk about that yet, Kassel? It's coming. Oh, okay. We talked about it in prior <laughs> lessons, but we're about to go over it again. <laughs> I want to make sure. I was like, hold on. Um, so you can see that this man was not very close to Allah. He wasn't walking in the, the path towards love because, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, so it showed that he wasn't actually walking in that direction. Many would say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Like, it's, it's interesting because if they were prophesying in the name of Allah, they would have been they would have been walking in the in the ways of Allah. So you can see that whatever name he was prophesying in, it wasn't actually Allah name. And in thy name have cast out devils. Like they're ascribing something to him that it wasn't it wasn't his work. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They were working iniquity the whole time. They were on their path toward hatred, and they were close to the devil, though they were ascribing whatever they were doing to whoever, they were deceitful. In all truth, they were crying because they were in a, in a, in a tough predicament. But their works, nothing they did was for Allah So let's see by a parable 
how he has grace in his life, but would judge us for our works in the end if we don't show the same mercy and forgiveness that Allah has for us. Uh, let's jump over to Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Please, Kasim. Matthew 18 and 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. So Christ is king. Looking at his servants, who he gave his life for to ransom with the price of his blood, and that debt is owed by his servants. All right, let's continue, Cousin. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So he was forgiven for a multitude of sins. So we're going to parallel the talents with sins, okay? This is a man who in his life hasn't taken advantage of the grace to pay his debt by overcoming his desires to stop sinning because he still has some desire he has pleasure in. It can be any pleasure of our own that stops us from obeying Allah so we can put ourselves in this scenario by applying whatever pleasure we have that hinders us from keeping the law to parallel ourselves as this man. So this is how we examine ourselves. Let's examine ourselves today. Now, this man, his issue is the love of money. And the Lord sees it in his heart. So let's see how things go for this man in this life before the judgment in the end of his life, who was forgiven for a lot, but hasn't paid what he owed because of not letting go of his desires. So the man was brought before the Lord because he owed him his life as a living sacrifice to do right, but he didn't pay his debts. Let's see the mercy the Lord has on the man in this life to help the man fulfill his debt to work righteousness in return for the price Christ paid for him with his blood. All right, let's continue, Brother Casa, in Matthew 18 and 25, please. Verse 25. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. All right. So the Lord actually had mercy on him to sell him into servitude. Just like we were talking about before, when somebody is struggling with something, or they have a struggle, it would be love to put them in an environment or put them in this situation that would actually help them come out of the struggle. And that's what Christ was doing for this man. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to put you into servitude, your wife and your children, because all of y'all have been affected by, by, by the iniquity or the sin. So I have to cleanse and purge all you guys so that you guys can actually come out of it. Now, so the Lord actually had mercy to sell him in the servitude so he can learn to work righteousness and pay off his debts. And that's the right thing to do. You know, that's the right thing to do to an evil servant is to put them to work so they can learn to do good. Like, I'm not just going to leave you to yourself. I'm not just going to say it and say you owe me a debt and then let you go forth and continue owing me a debt. That's not love. This is the way Elohim operates. I'm going to give you the free choice to go off and to, to do your will. And Elohim willing, you see that your own will doesn't work and you come and serve me and repent. Now, there's going to come a time where I'm going to visit you if it's taking you too long to come and serve me and repent. And I'm going to visit you and tell you what you owe me. Now, according to what you owe me, because you didn't come and repent and come to me, I came to you. So I'm going to tell you what I want to do. And if you don't agree with what I want to do, you're going to go further off into iniquity until you're judged. So let's see what this, what this, what, what the man, 
Um, let's see. No, let's get the scriptures on that first. Let's get the scriptures on um on what you should do for a servant that is struggling. So right, 33 and 25, please. And 20 through 28, sorry. It's all good. Sirach chapter 33, verse 25 to 28. If thou set thy servant to labor, thou shalt find rest. But if thou let him go idle, he shall seek liberty. Right. So just, just as Eli corrected his children and told them what to do, but didn't hold them accountable to put them to exact any labors upon them, he 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 did he did uh, foolishly, and it caused all of them to fall away. So just letting him go will only leave him to seek liberty to fulfill his desires. He's not going to turn from them because he can continue operating in them. If Christ only acknowledged our sins and let us go on continuing in them for us to make the change ourselves. He wouldn't be holding us accountable. Oh, continue, Brother Costa, please. A yoke and a collar do bow the neck. So are tortures and torments for an evil servant. So if he goes idle in his desires, that's where he will end up in torments after his death. So Ahaya has no pleasure in the death of him that dies. So Yahweh gives his servants what's needful for them to come out of the idleness and desires to avoid torments. So this is where he's actually helping you. Like the, 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 the corrections, the chastisements, where he may place you in your life. All those things are to help you to help you come out of your iniquity. The situations you go through, he's trying to help you come out of your iniquity. So do you avoid torment? Like he's coming for what he's owed because you didn't, it, you wouldn't turn. I'll continue, Brother Carson. Send him to labor, that he be not idle, for idleness teacheth much evil. Mm -hmm. So if, if I leave you to make decisions on your own or to, to do something on your own, you're going to be idle. Like, I have to send you to labor. Elohim has to send you to labor. Parents have to send their children to labor. Because if they're idle, it's going to teach them evil. They're going to continue in their iniquity because they're not being withstood. So what do we do, Casa? Can we continue? Set him to work as is fit for him. If he be not obedient, put on more heavy fetters. All right. So you, you set, set him to work as is good for him. And if he be not obedient to, the, to what you set upon him, put on more work. Put on more restraint. Hold him accountable. All right. I remember from discussing in the in the um understanding the Lahayim series parents and stuff the not being obedient is a test to see how far he can go. Mm -hmm. So you got to put on more heavy fetters by holding him accountable and not letting him go as he's trying to get the freedom by being disobedient, hoping you'll just leave it alone and let him do what he wants. Yeah, hoping you'll back off. Yeah. Like I'm gonna act up 
so that so that you scared and you leave me alone so I can continue in my iniquity. Yeah. You like you won't be wanting to deal with it. Like just give them what they want so you don't so I don't have to deal with it. like yeah, they got you. You know, remember we talked about how the way of the Lord doesn't seem equal to the world because the world view isn't in, in true love according to the law. The Lord helps his servants by putting them to work or in environments that will help them form new good habits and not letting them go idle and desires. So he was helping the man to put him into servitude, seeing as though he was still indulging in his lust in his current lifestyle, but the world would view it as a harsh reaction to put a servant or your child to more work if if they're idle in their desires or still being given over to their desires and not turning from them. Unfortunately, the servant himself, because of his pleasure and his desire, didn't want to do the work it takes to do right either. This is shown by him talking his way out of actually doing the work, unwilling to submit to his Lord's will and his life to help him fulfill the debt. You'll see it in the parable here, Lord willing. Uh, can we read Matthew 18 and 25, please? Matthew 18 and 25. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. All right, so remember a man affects his household, and so the wife. So either one of them can affect the household, and either can bring forth bad fruit in the house that affects everyone. So we see the Lord willing to save the whole house by putting them all to work. Um, can we continue in Matthew, please? Matthew 18 and 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped and saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Right. So remember he owed his debt to do right the whole time and didn't put the work in to overcome his desires, which in this parable means he didn't save up the money because money is what he loved for himself more than Elohim. So the worshiping and pleading for mercy is an attempt to win the Lord over and avoid the work to change, letting go of his lust. So it's deceit. He is operating, he's operating in deceit and putting on a show because the reason he's doing all this is because he got caught in his sins, still owing his debt. Not that he was truly repentant and wants to pay his debt or else he would have taken the just punishment to help him pay off what he owed with joy. Instead, he got in his feelings and started deceiving with the worshiping and pleading because he didn't want to do the work to let go of his pleasure by changing. He is essentially saying, don't make me do your will to do the work and change and give my life unto you to pay my debt. But let me do it my way, and I will repay what I owe. Mind you, he's been doing his way and hadn't paid him anything up to the date. Right? So obviously, his way isn't working. But he feels that his way is the right way. And he's not trusting Alahayim. Can we continue in Matthew 18 and 27, please, Casa? And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. All right. So he said, okay, I'm going to forgive you for your past sins. All right. You you saying you worship me, you're going you're gonna to do right. I'm going to forgive you the past debt. And I'm going to judge you based off of what you do from here on out. So the Lord has mercy in his life, respects our decision or, or the decision that he wanted to make, even when he knows it's not good for us. Because we all have free choice to do our own will in this life. So he isn't going to force us if we don't want to submit and humble ourselves and for him to fulfill his will for us. 
So he's going to bring what it is and you can choose either to stay in it to learn or you can choose to go and do what you want to do. We all have that choice. As Ahaya said, his patience and holiness bears with us in hopes we will repent and return. And here we see Yache is as his father to have compassion, though he sees the direction we're choosing it and wise, if that's the case. To give us a chance to come to humility on our own in hopes that we will see his way as the only way and return and submit unto him. And his way after we get the experience to see our own way doesn't work just that this man in the parable hadn't paid anything that he owed going his own way beforehand and won't pay when he has let go to continue in it this is along the lines of what ahaya said to moses in jubilees that we will go our own way and it won't and it won't work and then we'll finally repent and return to him and acknowledge that he was more righteous than us in all his ways and truly submit to servitude unto him in this law. This is Allahian's process where he lets us go do our own will. But when the time comes to receive his debt from us and we don't have it to pay, then he exacts labors on us to change our wicked ways to receive what he's owed. At that time, we'll either submit but continue in our errors of pride and evil. Allah doesn't forsake us hoping we'll see the truth that his way is the only way and return to him. Can we jump over to uh, Jubilees 1 and 5, please, Kasim? Sure. Jubilees chapter 1, verse 5. And he said, Incline thine heart to every word which I shall speak to thee in this mount and write them in a book, in order that their generations may see how I have not forsaken them in all the evil which they have wrought in transgressing the covenant which I established between me and thee for their generations this day on Mount Sinai. Right. So you see, he knows we may not choose to do his will at first and will let us go our own way as we desire to do our own righteousness or do what's right or pleasing in our own sight. Um, continue, Brother Casa. We're going to jump to 9. Sorry, verse 9. Verse 9. It's okay. Verse 9. For they will forget all my commandments, even all that I command them, and they will walk after the Gentiles, and after their uncleanness, and after their shame, and will serve their Allahayims. And these will prove unto them an offense and a tribulation and an affliction and a snare. So that's where we go our own way, but it's truly an idolatry spiritually fornicating by listening and following other spirits and their lifestyle instead of our Elohim seeking after our own standards of righteousness, which will eventually lead you to hatred. Yet it would be to our hurt as we won't have peace in life. What will come next when we see our way isn't working out? Um, verse 6, please, Kasa. Verse 6. And thus it will come to pass when all these things have come upon them, that they will recognize that I am more righteous than they in all their judgments and in all their actions. And they will recognize that I have been truly with them. All right. So we'll realize the Lord's service to submit and serve him in his commandments is more righteous than our ways. And he was merciful and truly more righteous than us. This is when we will truly turn with our whole heart, not thinking there is another way to do it after seeing our way doesn't work. And that's the humbling process that's going to help us be able to hear Allah Hayyam. And be and be in humility that we may be actually able to go in the right direction, because you have to be able to hear to be able to to walk in love. Like you can't be selfish; you have to be selfless. So you have to be able to hear everyone, and not just yourself. Can we read um, verse fifteen, please, Casa? Verse fifteen. 
And after this, they will turn to me from amongst the Gentiles with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their strength. And I shall gather them from amongst all the Gentiles, and they will seek me so that I shall be found of them when they seek me with all their heart and with all their soul. Verse 18. And I will not forsake them nor fail them, for I am Ahayah their Allah Hayam. Then will we be delivered from our sins when we truly come to him with all the heart and not thinking there is another way except his. It has to be this way, or else our repentance won't be sincere as the pride in us has to be subdued by seeing our way doesn't work and we confess it for ourselves and remember it. Because we have to go forth and remember we have to go forth and walk in understanding. So remembering that our way doesn't work. And holding fast unto Allah ways after um, investigating deity, investigating his works to see if they actually work or not, and holding fast to that and remembering that. Um, can we read verse 22, please, Kasa? Verse 22. And Ahiah said unto Moses, I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff nakedness, and they will not be obedient till they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. And Allah Hayam knows us. Allah Hayam knows our contrariness. He knows that we walk toward we like to walk towards the way of hatred he knows that us as a people that's what we do and their thoughts and their stiff neckness he knows our thoughts how we how we think about things he knows that we give ourselves over to wickedness and we uh forecast grievous things And their pride and haughtiness, where well, you can't tell them nothing. He knows that the only way we'll be obedient is if we confess our own sins and the sins of our fathers, because we also have to con confess that our parents didn't teach us right. Because if we still try to keep our parents in honor, we're being respected persons. And then we will start falling to the customs of, or traditions of men, the things that our fathers have taught us and holding fast to them. Allah knows us very well. So he lets us go down our own way to see it for ourselves so that we're able to confess it from the heart. As for pride, no one can tell us anything right? for us to listen, but we have to fall for ourselves because of pride, many of us. For those who are humble, take thought and listen and save themselves a lot of hurt in the process. Yet when the pride is subdued and we submit, then we can be given a new heart to truly serve in singleness of mind and heart, not seeking or believing there is any other way. It really helps us to be able to have that, that foresight for what's right. Kasa, can we read verse 23, please? Sure. Verse 23. And after this, they will turn to me in all uprightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. And I shall circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed. And I shall create in them a holy spirit. And I shall cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day unto eternity. 
and their souls will cleave to me and to all my commandments, and they will fulfill my commandments, and I shall be their father, and they will be my children. And they all will be called children of the living, Allah Hayyam. And every angel and every spirit will know, yea, they will know that these are my children, and that I am their father in uprightness and righteousness, and that I love them. So this is the process of going towards love. This is parts of it so that we can actually know when we're heading in the right direction. That's his love, to let us go and learn for ourselves and confess our own faults, then come into repentance to his service. Not everyone comes to that repentance as some die in the process being given over to their lusts or going their own way. So let's take heed and not use this as an occasion to give ourselves to our lusts. All right. Can we read on um, verse 10, please, Hassan? Verse 10, and many will perish and they will be taken captive and will fall into the hands of the enemy because they have forsaken my ordinances and my commandments and the festivals of my covenant and my Sabbaths and my holy place, which I have hallowed for myself in their midst and my tabernacle and my sanctuary, which I have hallowed for myself in the midst of the land that I should set my name upon it, and that it should dwell there. So we see why many are going to fall. It's because they're going to forsake Allah Hayim's commandments and his ordinances and the covenant and the Sabbath and all the things that Allah Hayim is requiring of us that are walking towards the direction of love. That's the thing that they're going to forsake and they're going to perish. For many are called, but few are chosen to make it out in Israel. So we have to take heed, and the Gentiles have to take heed as well. Though he leaves us to choose and do our own will after entreating us to put on his yoke and serve him, remember mercy and wrath come from the Lord. So, so though he lets us go when we don't submit to his will to help us, we will be held accountable in the end for how we use his compassion and grace. Now the man repented in hypocrisy, using guile to get out of the situation, as he didn't want to do the work to come out of his lust, to pay his debt. So we're talking about the man who Yache is, is requiring the debt of him. But rather use his words to get over and avoid the labor of changing, because he still wanted to fulfill his lust for money. This is what Isaiah prophesied hypocrites would do. Uh, can we read Mark chapter 7, verse 6, please? Mark 7 and 6. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. All right. So we worship and plead for mercy, as that sounds good and honors Allah Hayim in word when we are detected in sins, not paying our debt, but in our heart, we won't leave off from our desires to do the work to overcome them truly. And the evidence is shown in how we lay aside the commandments of Allah Hayim after worshiping Him and pleading for mercy to uphold our own ways slash traditions that we think is right to us. Can we read Mark 7 and, uh, 7 and 8 and verse 9, please? Mark 7 and 8. For laying aside the commandments of Allah Hayyim, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he saith unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of Allah Hayyim, that ye may keep your own tradition. You see that hypocritical repentance or worship is shown by following our traditions or traditions of men instead of the commandments of Allah Hayim, after praising with our words. This is what the servant did unto the Lord. As you'll see, as soon as he was finished worshiping and pleading to get forgiven, 
he went right back to fulfilling his desire for money and operating in what was right in his sight. Uh, can we read uh, verse Matthew 18 and 28, please? Matthew 18 and 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. So he went right back into his lust, looking for money. Also a sign of a person still in their own lust is the lack of mercy to forgive those who wrong them. As he was looking for who was indebted to him. He is not letting go of his lust of money, looking for someone in pride to fulfill the lust to get what he wants, which is money. Applying that to any lust from this parable, that if we go looking for opportunities to fulfill our lust, it's showing we still have pleasure in it. Let's see how this man, going according to his own way in this life, and his own desires, instead of submitting to the Lord's way, treat someone that wronged him All right so we know that covetousness is leading you to hatred so let's see how this man is is actually going to operate seeing that he was just called out for his sins called out for his debt and let's see the direction that he chose to go whether toward love or toward hatred um go ahead and finish brother Costa. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. All right. So we see he went towards the way of hatred. He didn't go towards the way of love. He didn't change his works. But he continued in the direction of the works that he was already working in. And that was his own way. Which is the way contrary to Elohim. Hatred and roughness toward those who trespass against him in his pride and lust, operating contrary to the law of Elohim and the Lord himself in love, as the Lord didn't treat him like that when his faults were revealed, that he owed the debt still. But in hatred of heart and shame from his own shortcomings being revealed, he imposed unforgiveness onto someone else that he felt wronged him. Can we uh, continue in Matthew 18 and 29 and 30, please? And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Right. So, you notice he can't pay his debt if he's in prison, right? So that means the other servant can't pay him and the evil servant also won't have the money he desired either. So he just went further. He went from covetousness to just straight hatred. He went further into iniquity. So, was this really about getting the money to pay the Lord and come out of his own lust? Why would the evil servant not put the man in a position to pay him so he can pay the Lord, which means have mercy so there would be mercy upon him? Because he doesn't actually want to pay the Lord. And that would mean he has to come out of his desires. But operating in hatred and roughness helps him stay in his lust as hatred stirs up all covetousness. Hatred and lust go hand in hand. Notice you might wonder why he's going so hard on the other servant. It's a mechanism of hatred to help in covetousness. By going hard and being unforgiving to who wronged him, it takes his attention away from the fact that he has a debt to the Lord that he ought to be focused on paying off like he said he would. This means not showing mercy to forgive those who wrong us from the heart by evidence of resenting or grudging or bitterness is a symptom of lust that still has place in us from the spirit of hatred at work in us instead of love. 
and it helps blind us from seeing the lust we need to overcome in ourselves as lust blinds the inclination. Hatred blinds the soul and anger about whatever it may have been, it's blindness, so we can't see it right. And the cycle continues where he is pleading for mercy when he sins, but goes right back into his lust after. And it's unmerciful to those who wrong him or remembers offenses done against him to keep him occupied from overcoming his own desires to pay his debt. And hatred, and hatred in its covetousness won't hear commands of compassion to forgive or have mercy upon one's neighbor, but will punish according to what it feels is right, holding grudges or remembering offenses and bitterness, not willing to accept an apology or willingness to move forward and work on changing to pay the debt like the other servant tried to do. The man had no mercy, nor was willing to put the person in a position to pay a debt by forgiving him or giving him a job to help him pay, which means maybe offering him solutions to help him or putting him in an environment to overcome the struggle, but rather threw him in prison where he can't work on paying the debt. So would we'll never be forgiven and stay in this lust, not able to work on overcoming it. So this is where someone doesn't want to overcome their own desires or has pleasure in their own desire, will compensate for their desires by operating in hatred to put you in, in, in the prison for their unforgiveness or grudge or bitterness about the mistake you made. They'll not let anything go or forgive or help you overcome the mistake you made towards them. And in many cases, won't bring it to your acknowledgement at all for the sake of them being able to use it at their will against you to keep them where they are in their lust and attempt for you not to be able to move forward without guilt to pay your debt or by doing right, but they'll hold on to it, seeking to imprison you by holding it over you so you can't move forward or do good works because of the guilt tripping they are putting you through. This is how hatred operates, because hatred wants to keep you in debt, imprisoned in the shortcomings of your past, so you cannot change or believe you can change by the guilt tripping of it, and you end up staying right where you are while that person who is holding the grudge with you is ignoring the debt they owe unto the Lord themselves, as they are busy themselves with holding you in prison for the mistake you have made towards them, not willing to let it go. The man in his life, because of his lust, held grudges and wouldn't forgive anyone because of his own desires. This helps keep people down and distract him to stay in his pleasures as well. Anytime someone won't forgive you or guilt trips you when you are working truly to overcome or have overcome and aren't operating the same, but they won't let it go, understand they are struggling with their own lust and trying to imprison you so you can't move forward and change. You have to continue to do the work in you and practice righteousness to attain unto love, having faith, Allah will forgive you. If you attain unto love regardless, then men don't let you live down the past. This ties back to when we talked about don't hate your own soul and don't let men please or respect the person to cause you to sin. And in this instance, it would please that person who won't allow you to live it down, to live in the prison of guilt and not moving forward in your own walk. But you know that it's not good for you and the debt you owe to give your life up, nor is it good for them as you don't want to be their crutch and excuse for not focusing on themselves by not pressing forward yourself. Hope that helped whoever needs it in, in either case. Now, looking back on this evil servant, he went about his life pleading for mercy when he sinned and got caught in it to get out of humbling himself to do the work and go right back into his lust after. Then operating in hatred, unforgiving or unhelpful to whomever may have wronged or owed him. This is the course of his life and the angels of the Lord are watching, giving the Lord an account of what this man is doing in his life. Remember the Lord lets us do 
as we will, but nothing is hid from him. Let's see how this plays out. Uh, can we read Matthew 18 and 31, please? Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Matthew 18, 31. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. So this is the angels that see and report the evil works. Though we were forgiven in the world and given the grace and choice to go our own way and do what we want, but in our death, we are held accountable for how we use that time of grace and freedom. Now, let's see how the Lord judges him after this world when he has to stand before his throne. Matthew 18 to 32, please. Verse 32. Then his Lord, after that he had called him. The sentence was given that he should return unto his maker. So this is the afterlife. So it said after that he had called him. So he he. He, it was the end of his life. Go ahead, Kasa. And said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So in his afterlife, he was delivered to punishments as is fitting for the evil servant, like we read in the wisdom of Sirach. He is punished for frustrating the grace of Elohim, not to have mercy and do justly as Elohim the Lord did unto him in his life. So he didn't go the right direction after he had the time of, of mercy. When Elohim came to exact his labors or to come and receive his debt, and gave him another chance, he didn't choose to go in the way of love. Well, I hope we're really taking account of that, that when Elohim comes to receive his depth, we have to be ready. And if we're not ready, when Elohim comes, to, to receive his death, you better get ready and start making the necessary changes. Because if you continue going the path you're going, you're not gonna you're not gonna continue much longer. And that's just the truth of things, being very, very honest and blatant. I can't take Alahan's words lightly. Uh, can we continue, Brother Costa, please? Yes. Verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and love. Walking in the law is the simplicity of what this life is about, to pay our debts unto Allah or else we'll be judged by him for what we are doing with this time of liberty to do as we choose. Those of us who don't take the grace serious will suffer as that evil servant when our time of repentance is at an end. Can we read the Apocalypse of Paul chapter 30, please? Apocalypse of Paul 30. And I saw there a fervent river of fire, and in it a multitude of men and women immersed up to the knees, and other men up to the navel, others even up to the lips, others moreover up to the hair. And I asked the angel and said, Sir, who are those in the fiery river? And the angel answered and said to me, They are neither hot nor cold, because they were found neither in the number of the just, nor in the number of the impious. For those spent the time of their life on earth, passing some days in prayer, but others in sins and fornications until their death. All right. So 
the lukewarm are punished for doing some good and some evil. All right. So these are those that dabble in both. They they walk towards doing good at times, and then they give themselves over to walking towards hatred at times. So they back and forth. Continue, Brother Castle. And I asked him and said, Who are these, sir, immersed up to the knees in fire? He answered and said to me, These are they who, when they have gone out of church, throw themselves into strange conversations to dispute. Right. So those who they at least go to church, but then they do evil after, and they're going to be punished because they're still lukewarm. So they go to church and then do evil after church. Continue, cousin. Those indeed who are immersed up to the navel are those who, when they have taken the body and blood of Christ, go and fornicate and did not cease from their sins till they died. All right. So now we've seen the the path that lead us toward hatred we're seeing the path that lead us toward love now we're seeing the lukewarm so we can see that we can't be found in the middle um so thinking communion was enough to justify them but didn't work righteousness to justify them like paul taught to do so they thought that the blood was going to cover them and they could go and sin after a, a continuing iniquity Right. These are different concepts. It's a different different um, perspectives that people pick up from whether it be a religion or themselves or whatever evil spirit. Um, you can continue, Brother Costa, please. Those who are immersed up to the lips are the detractors of each other when they assemble in the church of Allah Hayyam. So these are busybodies censoring the lives of others in the church. Vainglory, jealousy, and or envy is at work because them that compare themselves amongst themselves are not wise. And vainglory looks to lift itself up by critiquing others. So they're, they're lukewarm. Go ahead, Brother Costa. Those up to the eyebrows are those who nod approval of themselves and plot spite against their neighbor. So pride, self-justified, and operating in hatred toward their neighbor. So they approve themselves, but weren't actually keeping the law. So they thought that they were justified by their faith and not by works. So faith alone doesn't save us, but gets us punished. So they counted themselves a part of the number, not actually doing the work. Now, on the other hand, those who use the grace to learn and do righteousness will be kept and helped by the beloved Christ. Can we read the Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 7, please? Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 7. Therefore, at the appointed hour, all the angels, whatever, Rejoicing at once together, proceed before Allah Hayyam, that they may meet to worship at the hour determined. And behold, suddenly it became the hour of meeting, and the angels came to worship in the presence of Allah Hayyam, and the Spirit proceeded to meet them. And there came a voice and said, Whence come ye, our angels, bearing the burdens of tidings? Mm -hmm. uh, continue to chapter 8, please. They answered and said, We come from those who have renounced this world for the sake of thy holy name, wandering as pilgrims. So those who renounce the world look for the kingdom to come. That's the one that he has seen. All right. Continue, Kassel. And hungering and thirsting because of thy name. Mm -hmm. Because of the name of Haya, they hunger and thirst for righteousness like Christ taught them. Continue, Kassel. With their loins girded, having in their hands the incense of their hearts. Right. So believing that Allah I am in their hearts, though they literally were given um, oblations from their heart. Go ahead, Kassel. 
and praying and blessing every hour. But praying with thanksgiving and blessing as they aren't coveting the world or the desires of the flesh. All right? So they're focused on Elohim and getting to love. They're, they're focused on that path of getting to love. Continue, Kassim. And were straining and overcoming themselves. And they kept their lust in their body and mind in subjection, restraining themselves, not letting anything cause them to sin. And when they learn of a secret fault, they put the work in to overcome themselves. Continue, Kassim. Weeping and wailing above the rest that inhabit the earth. And we indeed, the angels, mourn along with them. Whither therefore it shall please thee, command us to go and minister, lest others also do it, but the destitute above the rest who are on earth. But for those who are actually working on getting it right genuinely, let's see what the Father with his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by him wills for these who are taking advantage of his Spirit of grace or his grace period. Uh, go ahead, Kassim. And there came the voice of Allah to them, saying, Know ye that now, henceforward, my grace is appointed unto you. So now they, they have his grace to grow and not be taken out of the world before fulfilling righteousness for a year. He gave them that. He gave them that grace. Because they were actually striving to walk towards love singly. Allah be glorified. Amen. Continue, Brother Kassim. And my help, who is my well-beloved son, shall be present with them, guiding them every hour, ministering also to them, never deserting them, since their place is his habitation. All right. So they also have his beloved to aid in fulfilling righteousness. Because remember when we read in the um, in Gad the seer, it said they shall be helped if they want to do what's right. Yeah. So now we get to see who's actually helping you when you want to do right and you're walking in singleness toward love. They also have his beloved to aid in fulfilling righteousness so they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them to overcome whatever struggles they may face. For any of us who are not joyfully doing the work and praying for deliverance from the struggles with cheer because we want to overcome them, but sorrowing and not diligent to keep ourselves so that we continue to fall in our lusts, let's see how Allah looks at us. So we want to see everything from Allah perspective and not our own or come to our own conclusion of things. Uh, let's see, uh, chapter 9, Brother Kassim. Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 9. When therefore these angels had retired, behold, other angels came to adore in the presence of honor in the assembly, who wept, and the spirit of Allah proceeded to meet them. And there came the voice of Allah and said, Whence come ye, our angels, bearing the burdens of the ministry of the tidings of the world? They answered and said in the presence of Allah, We have arrived from those who called upon thy name, and the impediments of the world made them wretched, devising many occasions every hour. Now the desires of the world, though calling upon the name, was what is truly in our heart when we aren't working every hour to restrain and overcome. But we are idle, giving place to the occasion of sin by letting thoughts and that help us operate in the flesh and that self-indulgence to give our minds over to the pleasure. Continue, Casa, please. Not even making one pure prayer, nor out of their whole heart in all the time of their life. All right. So the prayers aren't pure because of the sadness in heart when desires aren't fulfilled, but we don't want to let go of the desires or we fear thinking we can't overcome the desires, or we aren't content with where we are to do the work that's before us to come out of it. 
But if we would believe and be cheerful for whatever we face or whatever comes in long suffering with ourselves and contentment with Elohim's will, our prayers would be humble and pierce the clouds unto his throne. Let's see how Elohim looks at the sad man who is always sinning, not letting go of his desires, though calling on the name. I'll continue, Casa. What need, therefore, is there to be present with men who are sinners? So men can call on the name Ahia and still be sinners, as faith alone can't save us, but righteousness and good works is what justifies us. Let's see the Father's response. Continue, Casa. And there came the voice of Allah Hayyam to them. It is necessary that you should minister to them until they be converted and repent. But if they do not return to me, I will judge them. Oh, we have the time in this life to repent and return to obedience unto him in cheerfulness and long suffering, to learn and work righteousness by faith to attain unto love. But if we don't, we'll be judged. Continue, Hassan. Know therefore, sons of men, that whatever things are wrought by you, these angels relate to Allah Hayyam, whether good or evil. So nothing is hidden from Allah Hayyam. So let every man take heed and do the work sincerely, lest we fall into his hands in the end and have no fruits worthy of repentance. If we do right, fulfilling righteousness, and if it's appointed to be a martyr before Christ comes, after our death will be a joyful experience. And that's if that's Allah will for you. All right, can we go ahead and read uh, chapter 13, Brother Casa, please? Apocalypse of Paul, chapter 13. I indeed, when I had heard this sighed and wept and said to the angel, I wish to see the souls of the just and of sinners, and to see in what manner they go out of the body. And the angel answered and said unto me, Look again upon the earth. And I looked and saw all the world, and men were as naught and wanting. And I looked carefully and saw a certain man about to die. And the angel said to me, This one whom thou seest is a just man. And I looked again and saw all his works, whatever he had done for the sake of Allah Hayyam's name and all his desires, both what he remembered and what he did not remember. Then all stood in his sight in the hour of need, and I saw the just man advance and find refreshment and confidence. And before he went out of the world, the holy and the impious angels both attended, and I saw them all. But the impious found no place of habitation in him. But the holy took possession of his soul, guiding it till it went out of the body. And they roused the soul, saying, Soul, know thy body whence thou goest out, for it is necessary that thou shouldest return to the same body on the day of the resurrection, that thou mayest receive the things promised to all the just. Receiving therefore the soul from the body, they immediately kissed it as familiarly known to them, saying to it, Do manfully. For thou hast done the will of Allah Hayyam while placed in the earth. And there came to meet him the angel who watched him every day and said to him, Do manfully, soul, for I rejoice in thee, because thou hast done the will of Allah Hayyam on earth. For I related to Allah Hayyam all thy works, such as they were. Similarly, also the spirit proceeded to meet him and said, Soul, fear not, nor be disturbed until thou comest into a place which thou hast never known. But I will be an helper unto thee. For I found in thee a place of refreshment in the time when I dwelt in thee while I was on the earth. And his spirit strengthened him, and his angel received him, and led him into heaven. And an angel said, Whither runnest thou, O soul, and dost thou dare to enter into heaven? Wait and let us see if there is any of ours in thee. And behold, we find nothing in thee. I see also thy divine helper and angel, and the spirit is rejoicing along with thee, because thou hast done the will of Allah on earth. 
And they led him along till he should worship in the sight of Allah Hayyam. And when they had ceased, immediately Michael and all the army of angels with one voice adored the footstool of his feet and his doom, saying at the same time to the soul, This is your Allah Hayyam of all things who made you in his own image and likeness. Moreover, the angel returns and points him out, saying, Allah Hayyam, remember his labors, for this is the soul whose works I related to thee, doing according to thy judgment, and the spirit likewise. I am the spirit of vivification inspiring him, for I had refreshment in him, in the time when I dwelt in him, doing according to thy judgment. And there came the voice of Allah Hayyam and said, Inasmuch as this man did not vex me, neither will I vex him. For according as he had pity, I also will have pity. Let him therefore be handed over to Michael, the angel of the covenant, and let him lead him into the paradise of joy, that he himself may become co-heir with all the saints. And after these things, I heard the voices of a thousand thousand angels and archangels and cherubim and 24 elders saying hymns and glorifying the Lord and crying, Thou art just, O Lord, and just are thy judgments, and there is no acceptance of persons with thee, but thou rewardest unto every man according to thy judgment. And the angel answered and said to me, Hast thou believed and known? that whatever each man of you has done, he sees in the hour of need? And I said, yes, sir. So may we be like this, the righteous man that made it unto love in his life and that followed after steadfastly, not being lukewarm. May we also follow in that. And may we receive the same good, good turn that he received. So may we be strengthened to believe and, and work and put in the work that's needed. All right, keep us. You got anything, Kasi? Before we keep going? No, this is good. Okay. All right. So let's touch on some focal points for walking in that in that grace period towards love, all right? So let's let's look at the focal points and the things that's, that keep us going in our journey in the right direction. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and 5, please. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. All right, so that's where we want to be. That's love. That's when we get to love. Just like we learned about hatred, we get to also learn about love in itself and how Allah views love, not to walk by our own interpretation, but to walk by the interpretation of Allah and the perspective of Allah Now, we have to fear Allah with the whole heart and walk in simplicity according to his law to let the sum of our works be truth and what's really good in the commandment of Ahaya, so that truth may bud forth fruits in us. Can we read the Appendix of Levi, verse 84, please? Sure. Appendix of Levi, 84. I give you a charge, my sons, and I show you the truth, my beloved. Let the sum of your works be truth, and let righteousness abide with you forever. And the truth shall bud forth, and to them the harvest is blessed. So let the thoughts and intents add up to truth in the law without any personal agenda, so that righteousness may be with us. All right, so let's keep our, our in inclination pure and selfless, not allowing selfishness to enter into our vessels. Uh, can we jump over to the Testament of Asher, chapter 6, verse 3, please? 
Yes, Tetzim and Asher, chapter 6, verse 3. Do ye therefore, my children, keep the law of the Lord, and give not heed unto evil as unto good. But look unto the thing that is really good, and keep it in all the commandments of the Lord, having your conversation therein, and resting therein. So rest content in Allah's will with cheer in our speech and lifestyle and be truthful in everything for Allah's sake to glorify them. All right? It says, keep the law of the Lord and give not heed unto evil as unto good. All right? So this is why we have to have that the understanding of the law so that we can actually see what is good according to Allah and not what's good according to ourselves because that would lead us down the wrong path All right but look unto the thing that is really good and keep it in all the commandments of the Lord having your conversation therein and resting therein so you actually have to consume yourself in it so that you're not lukewarm you actually have to consume yourself and commit completely to go in one direction. Can we read uh Shepherd of Hermit Mandate 3 verse chapter 1 verse 1 please Mandate 3 chapter 1 verse 1 Again he saith to me love truth and let nothing but truth proceed out of thy mouth that the spirit which Allah am made to dwell in this flesh may be found true in the sight of all men. And thus shall the Lord who dwelleth in thee be glorified. For the Lord is true in every word, and with him there is no falsehood. So with truth be long-suffering and understanding to overcome any evil deed to maintain righteous works. Right? And that's going to keep us. That's going to keep us on that right path toward love. Right? Uh, Mandate 5, chapter 1, verse 1, the Shepherd of Hermes Casa. Hermes Monday 5, 1 and 1. Be thou long suffering and understanding, saith he, and thou shalt have the mastery of uh, all evil deeds and shall work all righteousness. All right. So this practice also starts in the mind to pray for and think of understanding and long suffering in everything. Right. So we have to be intentional about having long suffering. Mm -hmm. And understanding, because understanding, when we understand something, it helps us be long-suffering. So those two things go together to actually help us to bring forth good fruit so that we can stay on the right path. Continue, Brother Casa, please. Chapter 2, verse 3. But long-suffering is great and strong and has a mighty and vigorous power and is prosperous in great enlargement gladsome, exultant, free from care, glorifying the Lord at every season, having no bitterness in itself, remaining always gentle and tranquil. This long suffering therefore dwelleth with those whose faith is perfect. Chapter one verse two For if thou art long suffering, this Holy Spirit that abideth in thee shall be pure not being darkened by another evil spirit, but dwelling in a large room, shall rejoice and be glad with the vessel in which she dwelleth, and shall serve Allah with much cheerfulness, having prosperity in herself. Right. So we got to learn how Allah views long-suffering. See, because we want Allah perspective of what things are and how they operate. Right. Long suffering, it's great and strong, it's mighty and vigorous, um, prosperous and great enlargement, gladsome, exultant, free from care. So that means that you trust in Allah, that you're faithful, glorifying the Lord at every season. So it, it's always giving glory and it's having no bitterness in itself, it doesn't get bitter. It 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 it's always thinking of the perspective of Allah Hayyam, remaining always gentle and tranquil. 
not getting out of character or not getting um, fed up or angered or upset. But also operating in wisdom. Because wisdom has, that's why the Holy Spirit, for if thou art long suffering, the Holy Spirit that abideth in thee shall be pure. So you're going to get wisdom too. Not being darkened by another evil spirit. So she's not going to leave because that long suffering and the other spirits, charity and all these good spirits are going to be with her where she's not going to be vexed. But dwelling in a large room shall rejoice because she got plenty of room now and plenty of room to operate. All right. And she'll be glad in our vessel, which we actually have a vessel of honor and not dishonor. And shall serve Allah with much cheerfulness. So that means that we're going to serve Allah with much cheerfulness, having prosperity in herself because she's going to dwell with us. And wisdom is going to, to guide us. So long suffering with cheer and no bitterness or anger helps prepare the heart for the Holy Spirit. Right. That's going to help us in our, in our journey, in our direction towards love. So let's learn of fear, simplicity, continence, and godlessness. Uh, the Testament of Levi, chapter 13, verse 1, please. Testament of Levi, chapter 13, verse 1. And now, my children, I command you, fear the Lord your Allah with your whole heart, and walk in simplicity according to all his law. So wholehearted fear and simplicity to apply the law in every thought and action without deceit delivers from the thoughts wickedness projects to give place to lust. Right. Let's jump over to Shepherd of Hermes Mandate 2, chapter 1, verse 1, please. Mandate 2, chapter 1, verse 1. He said to me, Keep simplicity and be guileless, and thou shalt be as little children that know not the wickedness which destroyeth the life of men. Faith in the reward of salvation as the driving force to be continent keeps from evil, helps keep from wickedness attacks too, and helps develop cheer as it makes for a happy life keeping from evil. So you will notice the more you abstain from evil, the better your life is going to become. Let's jump over to Vision 3 of Shepherd of Hermes, chapter 8, verse 4, please. Hermes Vision 3, chapter 8, verse 4. And the second that is girded about and looking like a man is called continence. She is the daughter of faith. Whosoever then shall follow her becometh happy in his life. For he shall refrain from all evil deeds, believing that if he refrain from every evil desire, he shall inherit eternal life. And that is true. If we refrain from every evil desire and don't let it enter into our heart or into our, our, our senses, then we shall in inherit eternal life. The cheer in the process helps attain because sadness hinders the work. Sadness hinders our prayers, and it also and it makes it hard for Allah to help us. So when we have continence and we're happy and we're abstaining from evil, Allah is going to hear us and help us. So that's very important. Uh, let's jump over to Shepherd Hermes Mandate 10, chapter 3, verse 1, please. Hermes Mandate 10, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore clothe thyself in cheerfulness, which hath favor with Allah always, and is acceptable to him, and rejoice in it. For every cheerful man worketh good, and thinketh good, and despiseth sadness. So that's simplicity. 
and continence to let everything add up to truth and the law genuinely and not be deceptive about anything and just faithfully and cheerfully being continent to keep from evil bring salvation. Let's jump over to vision two of Shepherd of Hermes, chapter three, verse two, please. Hermes vision two, chapter three, verse two. But herein is thy salvation, in that thou didst not depart from the living Allahim, and in thy simplicity and thy great continence. These have saved thee, if thou abidest therein, and they save all who do such things and walk in guilelessness and simplicity. These men prevail over all wickedness and continue unto life eternal. These works get the victory over the wicked thoughts if we stay in them, and they will continue us on the path to eternal life. We have to come out of personal desires, though, and genuinely do it, because only a single face or single mind can intently attain unto this following the truth only with no hidden agenda. So it has to be a pure intent. It can't have any, there can't be any side agenda, any double-mindedness. It has to be purely for pure intent's sake of loving Allah With all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and all your strength. It has to be pure. If there's anything you're looking to gain for yourself, then it's selfish and it's not pure. And that will cause you to go toward the direction of hatred because of the selfishness. And then when you don't get what you want, you're not going to do right. Because you're looking to do what you need to, to get what you want. And that's not pure. That's not love. That's hatred. You have to come and serve Allah for serving Allah sake. And truly loving him. And only, only then will you be able to, to obtain If you're looking for your own gain and something, or you're like, Elohim, if you do this, I'm going to do this. Or if you give me this, then I'm going to do this. If any of that enters into your heart, then you're going in the wrong direction. And you're eventually going to bring forth fruits of, of iniquity because you're going to go the wrong direction. Uh, can we jump over to the Testament of Asher, chapter 6, verse 1, please? Yeah, Testament of Asher, chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed, therefore, ye also, my children, to the commandments of the Lord, following the truth with singleness of face. So it's only one way to do it, right? There can't be another way. It only can be Allah mm -hmm. way, and that's it. Um, can we read uh, verse 2? Two, please. When they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin. It's a sin to have a pretense or hidden agenda or be double-minded, as it will cause us to steal sin and be lukewarm, being one way before men and another in secret, or whatever the case may be. Continue, Brother Costa. But they both do the evil thing, and they have pleasure in them that do it following the example of the spirits of deceit and striving against mankind. So if there's a personal desire, it'll be shown in either continuing in evil things or having pleasure in folks who do evil things. So you got to work the commandments and everything because it's going to show forth. All right. And that's being double-faced. You can tell when a person double-faced because either they're going to do they're going to do the evil thing or they're going to have pleasure in other people that do it. Right. And that's a clear distinction. 
All right, so let's work righteousness for wisdom. Okay, now let's read Sirach chapter 1, verse 26, please. Sirach 1 and 26. If thou desire wisdom, keep the commandments, and the Lord shall give her unto thee. So it starts in the thoughts and shows in the works we sow. So it starts in our thoughts, and we bring forth those works through our senses. Um, can we read the appendix of Levi, uh, verse 87, please? Levi 87. He that soweth good, reapeth good. And he that soweth evil, his seed returneth upon him. So our life shows what we're working towards. And if we work good, we'll bring up our reward in heaven by overcoming the desires of the world. All right? Testament of Levi chapter 13, verse 5, please. Testament of Levi chapter 13, verse 5. Work righteousness, therefore, my children, upon the earth, that ye may have it as a treasure in heaven, and sow good things in your soul, that you may find them in your life. Mm -hmm. So you see, it starts with the thoughts we sow to enable us to work righteousness in our life. If we let wickedness in to get us into evil thoughts, it's going to affect our works, which will show itself in our life. All right? So we truly have to choose what it is that we're going to do in our minds. Our thoughts have to be, we have to be working righteousness in our thoughts and not being idle. We don't want our mind to be idle where we're allowing evil to be entertained in our, in our mind. So if we're not at a place where we're able to, to calm our mind and not think anything for the sake of peace, then we need to be putting on those heavy fetters in our mind to continue, um, to continue thoughts of good and righteousness in our, in our mind so that Wickedness doesn't have a place. Um, can we continue, Brother Costa? But if you sow evil things, you shall reap every trouble and affliction. All right. So if you if you sow evil things or evil thoughts in your mind, you're going to reap every trouble and affliction because that's going to be brought forth through your works. All right. So for those reasons of wanting a happy life through obedience, let's focus on the task of getting wisdom through the fear of the Lord, wholeheartedly keeping his law. All right. So let's continue, Cosmo. Verse 7. Get wisdom in the fear of Allah with diligence. So the world is changing and going to be very dangerous one day. So we have to understand these things because we don't want we don't want to be walking toward the direction of hatred where other people are already at hatred. So we have to be mindful that the world is going to get worse because people are going in the wrong direction and they're giving over themselves to the wrong direction. Um So by getting wisdom through obedience, it's going to protect us from it all because we're going to need wisdom to be able to walk in these times. Uh, let's continue, Brother Costa, please. For though there be a leading into captivity and cities and lands be destroyed and gold and silver and every possession perish, the wisdom of the wise not can take away say the blindness of unholiness and the callousness that comes of sin. All right. So unholiness, the sin, and that sin blinding us and in, insensitivity in to be cruel towards ourselves and others is going to be what can get us hurt in the times to come because that's where a lot of other people are going to be. They're going to be blinded of unholiness and callous and they're going to be callous when it comes to sin. So they're not going to think twice. So we have to have this more the reason why we have to get it together, that wisdom may be with us, and that we may be strengthened to do all things 
by Christ because we're going to need it in the times to come. And if we're found being lukewarm, Allah Hayyam is not going to be with us. So it's very important that we actually commit and walk in one single direction toward love that Allah Hayyam may be with us and actually help us, give us the help that we need. Brother Kassim. For if one keep oneself from these evil things, then even among his enemies shall wisdom be a glory to him. And in a strange country, a fatherland, and in the midst of foes shall prove a friend. So many of us will have to leave our native lands we grew up in or lived in just like Abraham in these times to come to live in a strange land. And though we will be strangers in it, Holiness and righteousness and love through wisdom will be a comfort to us and keep us and will have favor nonetheless from those of those respective countries because of the way that we're operating and because of the love that Allah is, is in the journey that we're on heading toward that love and the works that we're working. And people are going to appreciate it and you're going to gain a friend because the love that you have, no matter where you are. So, Allah Hayyam, definitely keep us and strengthen us on our journeys toward love. And may we all choose that journey toward love, that Allah Hayyam may be with us and be strengthening us, that we may reach unto his salvation in our Adonai Yache Christ. You got anything, Kasim? <clears throat> no, I don't. This is good. Praise Allah. Amen. All right. Well, we pray Allah keeps you all. Please remember to go and check out the website, www.hebrewreaders.com. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and hit the bell notification so you get all the new videos that come up. And we love you guys. Praise Allah. Peace. Ciao. HRC, 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 HRC,